Okay, it's starting to stream. Great, thank you. Uh, good morning. Today is Wednesday, January 20th, Inauguration Day. And uh, this is a meeting of the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee. Uh, it's 8.30, so we're gonna get started. Um, we have been, uh, so far, been following up on uh, COVID-related issues directly, uh, making sure that all the area operating areas we work with are uh, operating smoothly. And so far, that's the case. We have one more bit of work to do on solid waste, but um, we're going to shift gears this week and start bringing information into the committee to um, help us come up to speed on what's going on in the energy uh, side of things. And um, Senator McCormick says it. I think Senator uh, President-elect Biden says it. Climate change is the existential threat of our time. So um, I think it's appropriate for us to shift our focus as time allows and start to um, engage on energy work for the session. So uh, there is, uh, I'll, I'm not paid to say this, but I'm happy to say this. Um, I know of no organization that gathers more information and distills it into a more useful format in the state than the Energy Action Network. So uh, I've asked uh, its executive director, Jared Duval, to join us this morning to help us uh, get, uh, uh, to reintroduce us to the landscape through their, re their reporting. And then I also uh, asked if he could help us swing back when we finished that general survey to look a little bit at the areas of greatest opportunity um, for this committee in terms of making progress. So with that, good morning, Mr. Duval. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Chairman Bray and members of the committee. Um, it's great to be with you. And, and thank you, Jude, for your help in scheduling and, and logistics. Um, if it's all right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that you can um, see my slides. Um, can you give me a thumbs up if you see that? Perfect. Good. So um, again, for the record, my name is Jared Duval, Executive Director with the Energy Action Network. Um, you know, first I wanna just start by describing EAN because it's really two things. Um, on the one hand, you, you may know it as a very wide and diverse network of over 200 member organizations. Um, you see a, a illustration of, of some of our, the diversity of some of our members on, on this slide, everyone from uh, utilities to fuel dealers to colleges and universities, uh, businesses, nonprofit organizations, basically any organization or entity in the state of Vermont that has an interest in um, understanding and helping meet our state's energy and emissions reduction goals. Um, additionally, we have a wide network of, of public sector partners, state agencies and departments that EAN, the backbone nonprofit organization works with as Senator Bray said, to collect the, the, the best available in the latest data and analysis to really stitch together um, a comprehensive story of where we stand and what it will take to get where we're trying to go, where the state has committed to go um, in terms of our energy future and our emissions reduction commitments. I see uh, Senator Leahy's bumper sticker. I don't see mine. I see. <laughs> I, I'm sorry that that was omitted this time, Senator Kim. <laughs> we'll make sure that it is added for the next presentation. <laughs> it's and, and under sorry, the it's under the Bernie Sanders um, um, bumper sticker. All right. <laughs> I thought you had your own full screen. Uh, that's what we were waiting for. Um, and you know, one quick thing, just so everyone knows, we have uh, 75 minutes all together. So uh, we can, we have ample time for a presentation and a full discussion before we have a break and move on. So I just want people to know the, the point, especially while we have Mr. Duval here, is really have an in-depth conversation about this, not just sort of cruise through the slides. Yeah. Thank you. And so on that point, please, at any point, if there's a clarifying question um, 
or if, if you think that there's an important opportunity for discussion, please interrupt me and I'll, I'll look for um, either hands or, or listen for interruptions. Um, so, you know, in support of, the, of this network that I've described, we have a small, what we call backbone nonprofit organization, three staff that really serve two key roles. One is to be a trusted neutral convener because while all of the members of our network share the same goals as the state of Vermont um, around our energy and emissions reduction uh, commitments, they have different um, levels of priority and different opinions about the near term opportunities to, to meet those goals. And so we commit as a uh, um, neutral trusted convener um, not to do any lobbying on bills that may be before you on dockets in front of the Public Utilities Commission. And we commit to serve as an independent tracker of progress and analyst of information so that we can, even if we are not as an organization or as an entire network going to take positions on public policy issues, we want to make sure that our public policy discussions in Vermont, discussions about new programs that may be created are grounded in the best available data and analysis, that they're evidence-based and that they're really um, have the potential to be as effective as, as they're intended to be. So with that, I'm gonna start, um, this is a uh, visualization of the data that comes from the State Agency of Natural Resources, their um, annual greenhouse gas inventory, which was last released last year. They're currently working on an update. Last year's greenhouse gas emissions inventory um, went through 2016. And here, what you can see is everything that is colored in is our historic emissions uh, statewide in Vermont from 1990 through 2016. And these colors show where those emissions come from by sector. So the largest is transportation in green. The next largest is, is thermal. This is also known as residential, commercial, and industrial fuel use. Um, uh, electricity is, is, is small and, and shrinking, um, even smaller than the agriculture um, sector, which you see here in yellow, and then the remainder are in industrial processes and, and waste management. Here you see the commitments um, that uh, exist in now the, the Global Warming Solutions Act statute um, to get to at least 26% below 2005 levels in the next five years, and then uh, these further out uh, um, ones in 2030 and 2050. Now, I'll, I'll just note because it's, it's hard for me to get my head around the scale of this sometimes. So it, I think it's helpful to have a reference point. A million metric tons of carbon or a carbon dioxide equivalent is roughly the equivalent of burning a hundred million gallons of gasoline. So the approximately 10 million metric tons of greenhouse gas pollution that Vermont creates each year is roughly the equivalent of burning a billion gallons of gasoline. Um, so a billion gallons of gasoline is roughly the equivalent of, of our, our emissions. Um, I will say that it, it can be sometimes important to, to look at the baseline year because our official goals, uh, both over time and in the Global Warming Solutions Act <laughs> reference different years, specifically 2005 um, and 1990, which had very different emissions levels. So even if we look, you know, you look at, 26% reduction by 2025 sounds larger or, or sounds may sound you know a bigger lift than then just getting to 40% below five years later but the baseline switches to 1990 so there's actually a greater emissions reduction uh, lift that we're going to have to do between 2025 and 2030 than we do between now and 2025 because you're moving from this baseline to this baseline and that's just in keeping with what the international kind of agreements that they were based on when they were created and what reference point they used. Um, so oftentimes, you know, we have conversations about emissions in Vermont that, that parallel national conversations. And sometimes that's um, 
appropriate, but other times it can be really helpful to understand how we're, how our, how we're very different and how our unique situation requires a different response than the policies and programs that are talked about at the national level. And the, the biggest one is that for a long time, people uh, in national climate conversations have used the words energy and electricity interchangeably. And for a long time, that's been because our electricity generation as a country has been the leading source of our emissions. Um, in the last five years, um, that has changed and transportation emissions from our transportation sector have become the largest in the US. But here in Vermont, um, our electricity sector emissions have always been, um, there are different ways to measure it, but either the lowest or among the very lowest in, in the country. It doesn't mean that they are totally carbon free. Um, it doesn't mean that there is not more progress we can make in that sector, but it does mean that it is a really relatively small component of where most of the uh, pollution and, uh, and the cost to Vermonters in terms of our, the energy costs we bear are. And those are really in the transportation and thermal sectors. Um, and so these two side-by-side -side pie charts just show the difference between where uh, the emissions come from by sector in Vermont versus the US as a whole. We have a very different situation here than, than the country overall. Um, Mr. Duval, quick question. Yeah. Is the relatively larger portion for thermal and transportation in a Vermont largely attributable to how small our, electricity, our, our emissions in electricity are? Or are we outliers also in terms of the emissions per capita for transportation and thermal? Um, both to a, to a degree. So yes, our electricity emissions have, have always been low because um, I mean, relative to the rest of the country, um, whether the primary sources have been hydro or, or nuclear, um, there are different ways to measure those, those generation sources, but they, no matter how you measure them, they um, are, are low emitting uh, electricity sources uh, compared to what a lot of the, uh, the rest of the country is looking at, in especially uh, cold fired power plants out in the Midwest and um, other parts of the country. Um, our, um, uh, you know, we have the second highest reliance on delivered heating fuels um, in, here in Vermont after Maine um, in terms of fuel oil and propane, which um, there are different ways to, to measure this, but um, many studies suggest those are the, the most polluting in terms of greenhouse gases, um, uh, aside from, from coal, but very few people use coal for heating directly anymore. Um, and then, you know, our vehicle miles traveled uh, are higher here in Vermont than they are uh, anywhere else in the Northeast. So, I'll, 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 and I've got some slides on that um, later in the presentation. I can't recall um, if, and I believe, although I would have to double check that the average vehicle miles per tra traveled here in Vermont are higher than the nation as a whole. So um, I believe that you're correct on both of those, uh, but I, I need to double check the national VMT numbers. Thank you. So this is another way to look at the breakdown of uh, emissions by sector in, in Vermont. Um, and the ones that are highlighted in green are the energy sectors. So, you know, together, how we get around and how we heat our homes and buildings are responsible for over 70% of the state's emissions. When you add in electricity generation, our energy use is, uh, accounts for about 80% of, of our statewide emissions. So one of the things that we did last year is we collected all of the greenhouse gas emissions inventories um, through 2016 of all of our surrounding states, also including the province of Quebec, our neighbor to the north. And what we found is that um, among all of those, we are making the least progress towards um, the Paris Climate Agreement, which is also the, as you all know, the first target, uh, first requirement of the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, we are only 5% below our 2005 emissions levels. Um, you know, and I think this is oftentimes surprising to people because folks are aware that our electricity sector emissions have declined um, 
you know, over this period. The challenge is they have been more than offset. They've been dwarfed by the increases we've seen in these other th sectors, especially the transportation sector, where we've seen a growth of almost a million metric tons uh, relative to the original 1990 baseline. Um, but policy has made a difference. You, you look here, this, this is our electric sector emissions over time. This was the passage of the renewable energy standard, which drove um, a lot more um, both renewable and low carbon electricity purchases. Um, so much so that in the, the next inventory um, that's published, it will show um, our emissions declining you know, uh, to, to an amount that is, um, you know, maybe makes them two or three percent of our total emissions. So if you look back at those, those previous slides where it showed the electricity sector responsible for approximately eight percent of our emissions, that is steadily going down in time as the renewable energy standard gets implemented. Um, and even less we have even less reliance on, on fossil fuel generation as part of the ISO New England mix. Um, so I think we will see in the next inventory something like two or three, only two or three percent of our emissions coming from electricity generation. Uh, Senator Bray. Uh, yeah, Senator Campion, please. Uh, I, it's just really an observation. I, everyone's seeing it, but it it is interesting to me how much we need to partner with the Transportation Committee. Uh, and really, I think pushing them isn't the right word, but maybe it is. It it's, reminds me some of this, <clears throat> this conversation of PFOA. We kind of focus on the small things sometimes and it, we're not focusing on the huge things. Um, the case of PFOA, it's, it's the factories. You know, We think about all these smaller things we can do and we kind of put it on consumers. But really, it's it's the bigger issue. It's in this case, it's the transportation industry, and I think our committee has a has a big role here to push the transportation committee. Otherwise, we're just not going to get there. Thank you. I, I would just um, say I agree with that, but the reluctance in the transportation committee is going to be that if we can't find a way to pay for the roads. Um, um, we're, we're, we're at this block and there's a reluctance amongst the transportation agency and, um, and a, a transportation committee to move ahead on this. So it, it is this block, you know, of um, what you do. Yeah, no, I think Senator Westman's point's an excellent one. And I, I think then maybe, you know, one of the things we can just work on in this committee is helping get over that block. I mean, how would we, what are the tools we would give the transportation committee or advocate for that would get us beyond that? You know, how will we pay for the roads? Um, right, so, right. Yeah. Mr. Um, Chair. Yeah, uh, Senator McDonald, please. The, the easiest thing in this entire discussion is how to pay for the roads. That's mathematics and transportation committee could, could do that, but I, I think we need to look at why um, why we need to tackle the transportation from the point of view of climate and have a plan and then let transportation deal with, with what it's really good at, which is doing the math to keep the roads going. That's just, that's simple. Um, people understand that issue. It takes this amount of money to fix roads. What we don't have is a consensus around what the, some of the things that I think Jared will continue to talk to us about, about how we are you know, buying bigger and larger vehicles and, and consuming more and more gas at the same time we're talking about going in the other direction. Thank you. I, I, I can't let that pass. Um, Mark, that's easily said for someone that has not been in the position of sitting in a seat where you have to say, if I move um, to um, vehicles that presently are not paying in the mileage that they use, um, it, that's, that's a really difficult nut to get over. And I am quite encouraged um, by the fact that the car companies have finally come out with pickup trucks. 
which is a huge part of our usage. And I want to see people use more electric vehicles and move off from fossil fuels. But the reluctance within the transportation community is how do you put a tax on? And everyone says, as soon as you put a tax on electric vehicles, it's discouraging their use. And so you're at this impasse. And um, I can't let you just say that's easy to get over. Um, so you, we should, Mr. Chair, yeah. Senator Westman is, is correct. The, the political ability to get over it is going to be tough. But we're here, we we're here learning about the trends of pollution. And Jared has just talked about how difficult it's going to be between 25 and 2030 to meet that second step. That's, we just talked about that briefly. And that automobiles that are being sold today, um, the people who live in rural Vermont and who have less than median incomes in Vermont, the average age of the vehicles that those people own is 12 years old. So every vehicle gets sold today that, that burns more fuels is gonna be in the hands of the very folks that we say are having a tough time getting by and gonna be owned by them 12 years from now, unless we change that. Um, so let the, the tough thing is to get, you know, I mentioned before when World War II began, Oh. The United States of America stopped manufacturing all vehicles. They stopped. And it took them six, less than six weeks to, or seven weeks, and they stopped doing it. Now, that takes political courage, and we're not going to do that. But that's the sort of challenge we're facing. Um, so let's get on with how do we, if you had, we had the ability to craft a plan that would actually reduce it, um, keeping the roads maintained after we do that will be relatively simple. So, so clearly there's a lot of interest and energy around this part of the puzzle. And I think everyone wants to get to a better place. And we had a, we had a bill actually three years ago that proposed how to have EVs contribute to the road tax. Um, so, but if the timing wasn't right, and it, wouldn't, it didn't advance. But <clears throat> I know there's a lot of interest in solving that. Um, Senator Westman, a tough nut to crack. And <laughs> so, great, we, we know we need to do that. So let's keep going with our um, survey. And thanks to everyone for flagging this one is I think all the way back to Senator Campion's comment, we, we haven't worked uh, hand in glove with transportation. We've been pr relatively independent. I mean, we have an amicable relationship, but we operate quite independently. There's an opportunity for us to figure out ways to operate and help each other more. So let's, we'll, we should probably uh, think about having a joint meeting uh, with transportation, which I don't think we've ever held. So, okay, Mr. Duval. Thank you, Chairman Bray. Um, so, so this slide looks at, um, compares the per capita emissions between uh, Vermont um, and the surrounding states. Um, and what we see here is that, you know, we have, all of the states in this region have lower per capita emissions than the United States as a whole. But ours are the, the highest in the, the region. Um, at about 15 tons per person um, here in Vermont. And folks, you know, often wonder, you know, how, how can this be? Why is this? And the main reason is that we drive, more, there are more miles driven per capita in Vermont than any other state. This is partly due to our settlement pattern. Um, and these numbers have been going steadily up over the last five years. You'll see this is only from 2015, that's the latest year for which we could get comparable data from surrounding states. But this, this number um, is, uh, I believe, around 12,000 
miles per person in Vermont. This has been steadily going up over the past uh, four or five years or so. At the same time, new car purchases, there are about um, 100,000 uh, vehicles purchased in Vermont every year. Two thirds of those are used and a third of them are new purchases or leases. And when we look at registrations, what we find is that there is a steadily declining um, preference for passenger cars. And instead, the share of new vehicles purchased um, that are larger um, in this category of light trucks includes pickup trucks, crossovers, uh, sometimes CUVs or car SUVs, they're called different things, and SUVs. Um, but we've gone from, you know, 55% of new vehicle purchases or leases being in that light truck, again, pickup, CUV or SUV category in 2012 to 80% in 2018. And the preliminary look at the numbers from this year is that that has continued um, and that this year's new vehicle sales were, um, I believe, 84 so far year to date. Um, the, the data we have is through November, 84% um, in the light truck category and only 16% in the passenger uh, cars. So even while newer vehicles have um, higher fuel efficiency ratings, we're not getting the full benefit of those fuel efficiency increases because um, of the bigger vehicles that folks are opting to purchase. You can see that even with that trend, we're still seeing fuel efficiency increases, but they're relatively small each year, maybe 0.3 miles per gallon per year, which is influenced by this, this increase in bigger vehicle purchases and the decrease in the sale of um, smaller, more generally efficient vehicles. Um, I want to turn now uh, to the um, thermal sector, the heating sector. Um, this graph shows um, where our heating energy sources come from. Um, the plurality is, is heating oil, next is natural gas and propane, and you see you add those all together um, and fossil fuel heating is, is you know, by, by far the, the main way that, that we heat in, in Vermont. And again, as I said earlier, delivered uh, fuels have, have been less regulated in the past, like heating oil and propane uh, together make up about half of that. This, this breaks those thermal sector emissions down um, in terms of you know, whether they're residential at the home level, commercial kind of businesses, or industrial. And, you know, I think in a lot of these discussions, we immediately turn to, you know, a, a big emitter in terms of industry or a, a, a big business. But really, it's, it's the long tail here that, that really adds the, the biggest amount of emissions. More than half of our thermal sector emissions come from how we heat our homes. And it's homes and businesses mostly small businesses combined are about 85% um, of, of those emissions. So while EIN does not take positions on specific bills or policies that may be before you, we do scan the peer reviewed literature. We look at the best available data to say, given the known and proven and available technologies um, and given the kind of uh, characterizations and, and kind of evidence around what they can contribute in terms of emissions reduction, um, we have uh, put together uh, emissions reduction pathways to, to meet these goals. Now, this is an, an old version that is in the process of being updated. I should stop to say that um, all of the slides that you are seeing today came from our annual progress report for Vermont um, that was released um, in March of last year. We are in the thick of producing our next report, which will be out um, this spring. Um, and so this is an old graphic, but it gives you a rough that is being updated, uh, both to what some of the emissions reduction pathways would be, not just for 2025, but also 2030. But this gives us a rough sense of the scale of transformation that, that we're talking about um, in terms of especially the transportation sector 
and the, the thermal sector. Um, and I'll, I can spend more time on that later. But um, I feel Jared, like, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Mr. A question on that last graphic, e acknowledging that the numbers are gonna shift around some, but I just wanna make sure <clears throat> I understand that it's not that you would do any one of these things The path is doing all these things at the levels listed, correct? That That's exactly right. Or they're equivalent. This is not meant to right. be a prescription that it has to be done exactly this way. They're, they're meant to be illustrative of the, the um, combined effect that we would need to achieve. So if um, the supply is not there um, in terms of um, electric vehicles, which you know, I, I think there are a lot of folks saying that 90,000 EVs by 2025 on the roads in Vermont may just not be logistically feasible. I, our next pathways analysis is going to have that number likely closer to 50,000 uh, electric vehicles. But that means when you do that, when you bring down this tall green bar, it needs to be offset by an increase somewhere else. So exactly as you said, Senator Bray, these have to add, a, it's not a menu of options, pick one, it's all of them combined or their equivalent. Um, right. and, and really this is just looking at the, the kind of energy sector opportunities. Of course, there are other opportunities in agriculture um, and in waste management, uh, et cetera. Right. Um, so one of the things that, that we did last year was we asked the Agency of Commerce and Community Development to do an independent economic impact analysis of what it would mean to the Vermont economy and for Vermont consumers if we were to achieve um, the, the transportation and green and thermal uh, um, targets here in orange over the next 15 years. Um, and what they found was that we would see a decrease in out-of-state spending uh, or dollars leaving the state of Vermont um, of, yes. of over a billion dollars. You'd see an increase in in-state investment of over 300. And most importantly, perhaps net consumer savings of about $800 million. Um, and so it, there's, there's two main reasons why you, we can see such large economic benefit to Vermont and to Vermont consumers from this transition. The first is that as um, you all are probably aware, Vermont imports 100% of the fossil fuel that we use. Um, and while the share of dollars that either stay in state or leave the state varies by fuel, when you add all of our fossil fuel purchases together, um, 75 cents of every dollar that we spend on it drains out of the state economy. Um, and over the past 10 years, if you look at an average of our fossil fuel spending, it's been about $2 billion a year. Um, and that's, you know, out of roughly a $33 billion economy, uh, the Vermont GDP, that's a, that's a sizable chunk. And so what that mean, that 75% means out of 2 billion is a, a billion and a half dollars draining out of the Vermont economy every year. In contrast, all of the alternatives that we look at to reduce fossil fuel use or get off of fossil fuels entirely, whether that is electrifying how we get around with electric vehicles, heat pump water heaters, heat pump space heating systems, or use, use, utilizing um, local sustainable efficient wood heating, keep far more of our dollars uh, here in Vermont recirculating in the economy and supporting jobs for our neighbors. So for instance, you know, rather than um, you know, only 25 cents of every dollar staying with fuel dealers in Vermont, um, 62 cents of every dollar that we spend on electricity stays and recirculates in Vermont. That's money that goes to uh, help uh, support line workers and tree trimmers and local power, clean power producers. And wood heating um, supports forest landowners and foresters and loggers and truckers. So this can be a positive feedback loop that reinvests in the Vermont economy um, and helps rather than sending our jobs, set, sending our dollars, um, you know, to, to places that are producing fossil fuels, whether that's Russia or Saudi Arabia, um, we, we can be investing those energy dollars in a way that helps build the Vermont economy um, and, and uh, support jobs for, for uh, fellow Vermonters. But it's not just a story of, of macroeconomic um, improvement for Vermont, it's also a story of savings for Vermont consumers. And the primary reason for that 
is that over time, and that's the lens that it makes sense to look at given the volatility in fossil fuel prices. Over time, we have seen that diesel and gasoline in the transportation sector and fuel oil and propane in the heating sector have been um, overall the highest cost and the most price volatile ways to get around or heat your home. Um, and that the alternatives, whether it is, you know, charging your vehicle with electricity, um, you see the, the equivalent um, uh, cost of electricity here in this graph in the upper, upper left, or whether it is, you know, electricity to power heat pumps or uh, wood chips or pellets, you see this graph in the lower right, those have historically been lower cost and much more price stable, more predictable for folks budgeting. Um, I should say that, that this graph is, I think, actually really conservative. It shows an average um, you know, price equivalent for electricity of about $1.60 a gallon for electric vehicles. And that's, that's true if we're just looking at the average retail rates from utilities across the, the state, but many of them are, are offering EV charging rates um, if, if there are demand uh, control measures where, so for instance, I have a charger in my garage that Green Mountain Power, if it's a peak load time, can, can pull back, you know, can not charge. And that, that gets me on a lower rate of about a dollar a gallon. BED has even lower rates than, than that. And a lot of folks who are purchasing electric vehicles are going on to that special EV rate. So this I think is actually higher, you know, than it, it actually is for a lot of folks who are driving electric vehicles. It's more closer to a dollar a gallon equivalent if you're enrolled in those type of programs. Um, yeah, you mentioned you mentioned BED, and I think <clears throat> I haven't checked in with Darren Springer just lately, but when they were doing a sort of a, a rollout and promotion this fall, uh, it was they were and under their new tariff, it was sixty two cent a gallon equivalent. So, a very attractive rate if you are a BED customer charging your vehicle in that program. Yes, and, and, and I would say, you know, it's not just about the, the fuel savings, it's also about operations and, and, and maintenance. Um, I don't have a slide on this here, but there was a, a, a recent report that just came out in the past few months from the Union of Concerned Scientists that specifically looked at four states and the potential savings for drivers in those states by switching to electric vehicles. And one of the four states in their study was Vermont, and they looked in particular at rural versus urban drivers. And they found that the greatest savings in Vermont would be for folks who live in more rural areas. And they estimated that the combined operations and maintenance savings with the fuel savings would be about $1,900 a year for the average rural EV driver. Um, mm. I would also say that I, I believe that there is a um, unfortunate myth out there about um, the upfront cost of electric vehicles. If we look at Vermont, the best selling electric vehicle right now is the Nissan Leaf, which I, that's personally what I drive. I pay about $200 a month to lease it. I've seen lease rates as low as $129 a month. If we look after the federal, the state incentives, the utility incentives, um, you know, those cars are not necessarily accessible for everyone but it is the, the story of electric vehicles is not just about, you know, Teslas and Audis and things that both are and are sometimes perceived to be much more expensive. The, the prices are coming down for a number of those makes and models um, as, as we see on the data. The best single source of information about uh, electric vehicles and trends and analysis is the Drive Electric Vermont uh, website where you can find some of that information. Great. Um, Mr. Duval, could you send that uh, UCI report to the to Jude, please? And I'll ask Jude if you could then distribute it onto the committee. That'd be great. Thank you. Yes, we will do. Um, I said UCI, but you Union of Concerned Scientists. I got it wrong. And then the other key component here, and this is this data is, um, you know, old. It does not reflect the the um, job losses that occurred starting in March with the pandemic. But through 2019, we had about 
19,000 clean energy jobs in Vermont. And the, the point here that's really important is not just the number of jobs, but the quality of jobs in this sector. So um, the Clean Energy Development Fund at the Department of Public Service um, publishes an annual clean energy industry report. And what they found is that if you average all of the clean energy jobs that exist across Vermont, the, the, the median wage is about $27 an hour for those 19,000 jobs. If we look at all jobs in Vermont, the median wage is about 19, was about $19 an hour at the, in the same year. Um, and so, you know, these are, these are good family supporting um, generally high wage jobs um, that um, are, will be attractive um, to un and underemployed Vermonters as, as we move forward. Uh, this is just a, a sampling uh, of some of the different wages in uh, the common jobs um, in these clean energy sectors. Um, the last part of my presentation, so we've covered um, energy and emissions, we've covered um, some of the economic um, implications, and now I want to um, spend some time on equity. Um, and so we've done a lot of research at EAN on um, the topic of energy equity, especially this last year. The working definition that we are using is that all people should have access to reliable, safe, and affordable sources of energy, protection from a disproportionate share of the negative impacts or externalities associated with building and operating our energy supply and distribution systems, um, and that there should be equitable distribution of and access to the benefits of those systems. So one of the key concepts um, when we look at energy equity is, is that of energy burden. And it looks at the percent of income that, um, or the share of overall income that goes towards energy spending. Um, and, you know, the Efficiency Vermont has done really important foundational work um, looking at energy burden in the state. Um, they published an update to a previous report last year that showed uh, here on the left, you see energy expenditures by, by town and then energy burden by town. So they were looking at it geographically. And what you can see is that there are um, greater energy expenditures in the high, in higher income regions of the state but that the energy burden, the share of income that is spent on energy is highest in uh, lower income areas of the state, especially in the Northeast Kingdom and in Southern Vermont. What we wanted to do was not just have a geographic look at this because of course there are higher income earners in low income towns and lower income earners in higher income towns. We wanted to look statewide by income. Um, and we had a, a great uh, summer intern, um, Jenna Slayton, who uh, is a um, major in uh, quantitative social sciences at Dartmouth, who pulled a lot of this data for us. So these are graphics she produced. Um, and what we see is that, um, you know, upper income Vermonters purchase a lot more energy, use a lot more energy than lower income Vermonters. Um, I, I hear that, you know, and I think this is an important point because a lot of times I, I hear folks who have the assumption that the opposite is true, you know, but, you know, upper income people, you know, you know, drive more for, for pleasure or, you know, have bigger homes. They, they generally consume more energy. But the flip side is that, and this is a reflection of greater wealth and in economic inequality that we see internationally and nationally, that lower income folks spend a far, even though they're spending less money on energy, they spend a far higher share of their incomes uh, on that energy, um, sometimes as high as 20%, which is consistent with what Efficiency Vermont found as well. Um, I think these are particularly striking when you look at them side by side, um, but those are just the same two graphs that I just showed. If you look specifically at thermal fuel use, um, we find that by income, lower income Vermonters uh, are disproportionately dependent on fuel oil um, and electricity uh, compared to, uh, and, and you know, are using disproportionately less um, 
uh, utility gas and, and wood than upper income Vermonters. And that has you know, implications. If, if we look back at that, those costs of different modes of heating, fuel oil over time has been one of the most up there with propane, uh, most expensive and price volatile ways to, to heat a home. Um, and the, the big, it, it, you know, at first blush, it might look like lower income folks using electricity for heating could be a good thing. But there are two very different ways of heating with electricity, of course. There is use of modern, efficient cold climate heat pump systems, which can save folks a lot of money. But then there's also the, the kind of old resistance baseboard uh, type uh, electric heating, which is, is very inefficient and expensive. And most unfortunately, so you see 20% of the lowest third of income earning renters are still heating with electricity that, and this is primarily that resistance electric heat. Um, so there are really important things that we can learn when we understand the energy burden that different uh, groups of Vermonters, whether by geography or by income face and the importance of designing programs that can help lift energy burdens. So the folks who can least afford it are, are oftentimes, you know, a fifth of them uh, in Vermont still uh, dependent on some of the highest cost heating through resistance electric heat. Um, so the summary here is that low income households purchase the least amount of energy, but have the highest energy burden and suffer the most intensely from that. Um, you know, so in summary uh, of this, uh, these slides, we have a moral obligation in Vermont, but we also have an economic opportunity um, in meeting our legally required emissions reduction commitments. If we're going to do so, we need to have a, a, a clearer focus and develop policy and regulatory tools that um, focus on the sectors where most of the pollution and most of the cost for Vermonters exists, transportation and heating. Um, and that doing so is, is, is not a sacrifice by any stretch. It is a, an economic development strategy for Vermont at a time when we need one, um, it, not just for you know, strengthening the Vermont economy and creating good paying jobs, but an opportunity for consumer savings when budgets are stretched thin and strained um, at a time of economic challenge coming out of this pandemic. Um, the last thing that I would say um, is that, because I, did, I don't think I said it clearly enough during the, the walkthrough of the slides, is that our relatively clean electricity sector gives us a foundation for making uh, more progress on emissions reduction than any other state in the country. And the reason for that is that you know, electric technology, whether it's electric vehicles or heat pumps, you know, they, they operate more efficiently. So even if you are, regardless of the generation source of electricity, because of the efficiency of those pieces of equipment, you reduce emissions up front. But you get an even greater emissions reduction when the electricity that those pieces of equipment, those electric vehicles, those heat pumps, when they are using low carbon electricity. And Vermont's uh, electricity right now is 62% renewable. These numbers will be updated soon, but as of the last report, 62% renewable, 92% carbon free. And that means that every time we take an action um, to change out fossil fuel transportation or fossil fuel heating with an efficient electric alternative, we get a greater emissions reduction bang for our buck from that action than anywhere else in the country. So even though we have higher per capita emissions than our neighbors, even though we are behind our neighbors, that is the, that the, the, the relative uh, low emitting nature of our electricity sector is a silver lining that yes, it can still be made more lower emitting. There is still important work to do to, to make sure that our electricity sector meets the targets in the renewable energy standard. But even as it is now, and even as it meets the legally required standards of the renewable energy standard, 
that is a foundation for progress that can allow us to make faster progress in these other sectors. That is an important piece of good news. This isn't just bad news that there's so much pollution in the transportation and heating sectors because of our fossil fuel dependence there. It's also that because of the important progress we've made um, with the electricity sector, in large part because of policies you all have passed or been involved with, whether that is the renewable energy standard or the regional greenhouse gas initiative, because of that, we are now set up to make very rapid emissions reduction uh, progress in those other sectors if we can get a handle on how to set the policies and regulations, send the market signals to help transform them, not only to reduce pollution, but to help save folks money and, and, and invest more in the Vermont economy uh, rather than in uh, fossil fuel exporting, the economies of fossil fuel exporting countries. With that, um, thank you and happy to um, take any questions or, or hear your discussion. Uh, Senator Campion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Duval, I'm wondering if you are on the climate committee uh, that the legislature created uh, and or how, how, do, how are you interacting with that group? And then I, I think the other piece of that would be if you are, is there a way for you to be communicating with folks about this, this need to pay for roads? You know, this seems to be an issue and, and that seems to be something maybe that committee could, could look at to, to help us with, with that. So anyhow. Um, yes, uh, so I was um, appointed by the Senate um, Committee on Committees to fill the seat on the Climate Council of the member um, of an organization with um, expertise in energy and data analysis. So I right. have um, been participating in the, the Climate Council as it, as it ramps up. Um, and um, I'm, I, I agree that that will be um, an important area of, of focus and information uh, sharing. Thank you. Um, thanks, Senator Campion, for that reminder. I think we'll want to come back and spend some time explicitly on the council and talk as a committee about how um, you know, how to have a, the most productive possible relationship we can with them. I think we are their first, well, there's a kind of a, we are established report that I think is actually coming out right about now, right? Isn't uh, Mr. Duvall, isn't there like a preliminary, very quick early days report, but the, the major deliverable is gonna be a plan at the end of 2021, right? Um, so while they're getting going, I think it would be great for us to, for instance, as you said, Senator Campion, handing off something that we're wrestling with to put into their in basket, seems like a great idea because uh, while we will adjourn for the summer and fall, I, I think uh, that so, that committee that committee will keep on working year round. So, um. uh, Mr. Chair, if I may also, yeah. uh, the the chair of that is Secretary Young. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Maybe we could have her in soon. Thank you. Okay. Um. And just to follow up on something Mr. Duval said about the opportunity of beneficial electrification, I mean, I think that really, to me, is uh, also, it, it's one of Vermont's most genuine opportunities. Like, we are increasingly making the default um, a clean choice for people. You know, I think of, sometimes I call Burlington Electric Department a postcard from the future, we also have two other utilities, I think Swanton and Washington Electric. They're all delivering 100% renewable energy to their customers. Whether someone thinks about environmental impacts or not, when they throw the switch uh, and turn on something electric, they're, um, they're, uh, they're not contributing to, to emissions. So uh, the goal is to get the, the entire state to that profile. Um, I, Senator Bray, other, hey, I just want to note that I, yeah. I see, because I know when we spoke earlier, um, you'd said that sometimes the, the hands didn't show up for you, but I see Senator McCormick's hand raised. Thank you very much, Senator McCormick. Sorry, uh, if I don't call on you uh, after a little while, don't let, I can't see your hands. So, oh, um, okay, I, I didn't realize that. I was, 
I was sitting here <laughs> indulging in, in, in uh, self-indulgent self-pity, uh, passive-aggressive self. <laughs> All right, um, well, release yourself from that. Thank and you. The, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, a disclaimer. I want, I want to focus on the economics here, but I want to acknowledge that doing that kind of could kind of plays in to what I call the uh, denial light regarding the moral obligation and the existential uh, obligation, uh, which, which is to say that even if this were an economic loser for us, I think we would have to then uh, bite the bullet and endure the economic loss because this is a fairly serious issue uh, as, as Senator McDonald compares it to World War II, or I would compare it for that matter to uh, our willingness to shut our entire economy down to, to stop uh, the pandemic. But ha having, having said that, um, I do want to want to focus on the on the economics. I want to want to thank the the witness. This is a good good presentation. I think that is our main problem, and and I hear it. I'm sure everyone else does from constituents. It's in the email. It was in the debates during the previous election campaign, and it's it's the idea that this is somehow an agenda of the environmentalists, and that the real issues are things like um, uh, our demographics, our, our elderly demographics, our um, uh, um, cost of living, all the, the, uh, the highway paving and so on. And uh, in that regard, I think we do have to address the economics. I am reluctant to address the economics as though everything hangs on that. I do want to stress, I think, even if it were an economic loss, we'd have to endure that loss because this is an existential crisis. But the fact that, in fact, it's not an economic loss is something that we really need to stress. And um, so I just wanted to thank the witness for that. Thank, thank you, Senator. In, if I may, um, you know, one of the um, threads of this conversation of, of previous um, times that, that I've been with your committee, um, and certainly a focus of the newly formed Climate Council has been, you know, how do we meet this moral responsibility, this legal uh, requirement in a way that is most cost effective um, and most, you know, equitable and beneficial for the Vermont economy. And I, I want to recommend um, that you uh, consider um, having in um, someone from the public service department. They have done incredible work on outlining um, uh, what they call a cost of avoided carbon study, or it's basically a cost effectiveness study of all of the known methods that we have to, to reduce emissions in Vermont. And they assess them um, just on a direct cost basis for, for consumers in the state. They don't even take into account things like the health benefits or the, the social cost of carbon, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that work has been led by um, Philip Peacott at the Public Service Department in developing um, those. And, you know, the, the, I think that is in the process of being updated, but the initial draft results, which had been shared, have been shared publicly previously, show that exactly to your point, Senator McCormick, a lot of these measures that we have to reduce emissions, um, we do so at, as we save money, um, specifically uh, electric vehicles, um, home weather is home and building weatherization, um, heat pump water heaters. These are things that um, when you look at the costs, not just the upfront sticker price, but the, the lifetime cost savings. Um, and oftentimes those upfront sticker prices are becoming more comparable with the fossil alternatives because of incentive programs. But when you look at that, it's, it's just a net win, both in terms of emissions reduction and in terms of consumer savings. Um, I think that one of the biggest challenges for this clean energy transition is short-termism versus long-term thinking. Um, you know, I, I got a, a mailer in my, in my mailbox this summer from a, um, a propane company that offered to give me for free a propane water heater. Now, why would they do that? Because they want to lock 
customers in yeah. on the highest cost, <laughs> most price volatile fuels. Now you may pay a little bit more upfront to install a heat pump water heater, but very quickly it pays for itself with the month after month, year after year savings of being on electricity versus, versus propane. And so I think that there is a major theme here that is about consumer protection because too often we're just looking at that upfront sticker price rather than the lifetime cost um, especially for folks, and we see this a lot um, um, among agencies that serve lower income populations in, in Vermont, when, when you are kind of, you know, just trying to get by, it's, it's difficult unless there is a consumer protection ally on your side um, to make, it can sometimes be difficult to make a choice that's going to save you money month after month, year after year, um, because of some of those upfront cost barriers, but work that is being done, whether it's through incentives, you know, there's a great program that Efficiency Vermont manages with VSECU, um, Opportunities Credit Union, and Neighbor Works of Western Vermont that can allow folks to get zero percent financing um, on on a on a loan um, to to make some of these improvements that will then um, save money year after year or can save money year after year. That's, a, I think, a major, um, as you, I think you were suggesting, Senator McCormick, major component of this whole conversation. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Senator McDonald. Um, I, I would ask, Jared, um, if it was possible in trying to tackle the, the, the big picture for you, I start off with the notion that anybody who buys a new vehicle today 12 years from now, that will be the vehicles, the most common vehicle on used car lots. And um, that's, that number is now up to 2033. And we're talking about making um, changes between 2030 and 2035. We haven't even got to 2030, 2035, knowing that vehicles that are sold this year will be the, the, the most plentiful vehicles owned by um, poor um, Vermonters, <coughs> the half of Vermonters that are on, on their second or third car. Next year, um, those vehicles will be the vehicles for sale in the used car lots, the only choices for people that buy used car vehicles, and that will be in 32. So I, I, if you could somehow do a picture that followed the pictures of the baby boomers, the graph of the baby boomers where American cities and communities sat and looked at what was coming and then built schools for those kids, which are of course now empty today, um, but built schools for those folks. There was a, a, a need to do that and it had to be seen. Um, if, if five years from now, um, electric vehicles hit that magic point where they begin to take off that will begin to change the used car market in 2037 or 2038 or 2039. And that's what we're talking today about the, the late 2030s. Um, it's, so. it, it's such an important point, Senator McDonald, because there, there's a limit to how much progress we can make if, if we don't focus on, on the equipment, because once that equipment is purchased, it, it locks in pollution and it locks in costs sometimes for decades. So, you know, roughly vehicles on the road for 10 years in Vermont, a heating system can be in a basement for, for 20 or 30 years. And if we're going to meet these emissions reduction targets, and if we want to uh, protect consumers from high and volatile costs over, over time, we've got to focus on that point of purchase of new equipment and do everything we can to disincentivize any further um, fossil fuel equipment purchases and incentivize the uh, alternatives. I think that the, the discussion about emissions reduction um, has um, unfortunately mostly in the past nationally and sometimes at the state level focused primarily on fossil fuels and the potential of pricing carbon. Now, I'm just gonna leave that strategy aside, but I think it misses this underlying more systemic question that you're getting at Senator McDonald, which is, you know, I've never spoken with a Vermonter who says that they, they like using fossil fuels. Most Vermonters use fossil fuels because it's what the vehicle they have or the heating system they have 
requires of them. And so if there's an increase in the cost of that fuel, oftentimes it can feel punitive if there's no immediate way to change that. You're just gonna have to pay more because that's the heating system you have or the vehicle you have. If the goal is to actually reduce fossil fuel use and carbon pollution, not just get people to pay more for it, which should not be the goal, then the, the opportunity we have is to focus at that key point in time of, of when a vehicle or a heating system is at the end of its life and make sure that that next purchase does not lock in 20 or 30 years more fossil fuel use on the heating side or 10 more years of, of high cost uh, fossil fuel use on the transportation side. Um, you know, a lot of states and provinces are starting to do that, focus on that equipment through performance standards um, in terms of just saying if something is this inefficient and this polluting, it should not be offered on the market. We're seeing California and Quebec yes, yes, you, have, it's, it, Jared, have said, you, you know, 2035, they Jared, will not allow the sale of fossil vehicles beyond that date. You are telling us this, and many of us believe it. And what we need to do is show, the question isn't what we ought to do and whether we're morally capable, of, et cetera, et cetera. If you have a chart and says that shows that this is what people are buying today, and this is yeah. what our country will look at and what consumers will have in the used car lots 12 years from now, and the graph keeps, keeps going with more and more vehicles, um, maybe they will look at that and go, wow, um, how do we prevent that from happening? Um, yeah, that's so a great Please, if you, can, that. if you can help us show what's going on, We'll definitely look at something like that. Show for other people before. what's going on. Um, then we're going to have to wrestle with the politics of whether Americans are too selfish or don't have the moral grit or the fuel companies are more powerful than we are and we can't beat them or that we're just, as a people, too damn stupid. But it, it, the problem won't be that we were not, we did not have an opportunity to see what was coming. And if you could help us see what was going to come in the absence, you know, thank you. Oh, thanks. And um, quick note, and then Senator Campion. So the, the, this this is uh, what you're talking about, uh, Mr. Deval. Comes right back down to that, like weatherization. We've been you've been participating in a group as have I since the summer, and there are conversations that predate that. Uh, when everyone knows that weatherization is a cost-effective strategy for the long haul to have a cleaner, healthier, uh, less expensive home to live in. And you can even structure a loan so that the savings pay for the loan. Why is it still so hard to make the transition? And it's like there's an energy of activation for changing behavior that I, I think we're still wrestling with. You know, what are those, what are the barriers that prevent people from, because when you discuss it rationally, every, I think you'd probably get a lot of nodding heads. Everyone will say, well, that makes sense. And, but there's a lot of momentum to keep doing things as we've been doing them. And I think there's a human behavior side that I think we're still trying to figure out how to communicate best and make better programs. Um, yeah, Senator Campion, I, sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Duval, did you wanna say something first? Um, just quickly f following up on what Senator Bray said, I, I wanna um, be sure to note that um, I know uh, some of you were uh, attended the um, annual summit of, of our network in October, um, but what we, our kind of approach is kind of, is crowdsourcing. It's, it's draw on the wisdom and expertise of, you know, Vermonters all across the state. We put an open call out to say, what are your best ideas for how we can rapidly, equitably um, uh, reduce emissions in Vermont, meet these, these targets, we got 20 ideas put forward and then we had, you know, the full network and set of public partners, over 200 folks review those, vote on those. And there are four teams that emerged from that process that are developing um, what, what many network members see as high impact promising ideas. And I, I wanna just highlight them very quickly in case there's interest um, in this committee and following up with the chairs of those efforts. So the first one is the one that Senator Bray spoke of, which was a, a proposal um, that has alternately been called Invest in Vermonters or Weatherization at Scale that um, was co-presented by Neil Lunderville CEO of v v VGS and Ludi Biddle of NeighborWorks of Western Vermont. 
which would basically look at, uh, you know, we're weatherizing only about 2000 homes a year in Vermont. Um, any kind of calculation of what we need to do to meet our emissions reduction goals and to reduce energy costs, likely that number needs to be five times higher. So they were looking at what, what would the programmatic and financial elements be um, to basically get to something like 10,000 homes a year. And of course that will have to ramp up over time, but that's the focus of, of that group. And it includes some really important ideas that Senator Bray has, has looked at, including this idea of, of freedom and unity bonds. There's also a group that is chaired by uh, Rich Cowart of the Regulatory Assistance Project, uh, the former chair of the Public Utilities Commission, that is looking at um, taking the model that has been used successfully in Vermont and elsewhere around a renewable portfolio standard and applying that same logic to the thermal sector, looking at a clean heat standard that would require uh, emissions reductions over time from fossil fuel suppliers of, of, of heating. Um, and there's a, a broad and diverse group uh, for all of these efforts. On the transportation side, um, there is uh, a, a team that is focusing on what is called the future of rural transit, um, looking at combining different um, funding streams and modes of, of uh, transportation for cost savings and emissions reduction. Um, that is uh, that in includes um, Jennifer Wallace Broder from VEIC and 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 Kara Robichek, uh, formerly with the Vermont Energy Education Program, and now on our, our team at Energy Action Network, and and finally a replace your ride effort that's basically a um, building on a California program, uh, improving on the former the problems of and uh, correcting um, the the cash for clunkers uh, program that had been done federally. But looking at, um, as and this gets to the point you were making, Senator McDonald, if we can not only get cleaner, less expensive cars on the road, but get the most polluting and expensive cars off the road at the same time through a scrappage, um, that can be an additional uh, strategy. And so that group is looking at that. It's chaired by EAN's senior fellow, Linda McGinnis, and also involves uh, Peggy O'Neill Vivanco from the UVM Clean Cities Coalition and Transportation Research Center. So if there's interest in any of those, um, um, I am happy to provide the contact information for the, the chairs of, of the groups um, that are working to develop uh, those I ideas. Perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, Senator Bray, the, the topic came up of a joint uh, uh, hearing with um, you know, other, other committees that some of those groups may be interested in, in presenting some of those ideas there. Um, I know that they have a um, interest in sharing them more broadly as well. Great, great. Yeah, I think um, we're overdue to find, uh, you know, develop, this is a big opportunity, this biennium to uh, have the relationship between the, the Senate uh, Natural Resources and Energy and Transportation Committees evolve, you know, let's collaborate more. Um, it, underneath it all, it's energy use. And um, so we need to, we need to, there's, I think it's an exciting idea. So, um, and I think uh, we will hear about all four of those proposals and not to be uh, shy or <laughs> uh, on, on the weatherization side, since I've been part of that team, I think, you know, that the, the, we have a, I have a bill in drafting, uh, waiting to see what the PUC report is that we get later this week, which addressed two things. One was, how would you have an, how might the state of Vermont have an all fuels energy efficiency program? And then within it, um, one of the two pieces of work is uh, the thermal side. So the, the bill and development addresses the thermal side, but um, it's a, a rough draft and let's see what the PUC has to say. Uh, Mr. Duval mentioned the Department of Public Service and as a matter of fact, they, after our break, which starts in two minutes, um, the department's gonna be in Mr. McNamara and Mr. Picot. So we are gonna be, and that report, uh, you know, three years or so ago, we said rather than sort of a hands-off, just general energy survey, could you also make that report uh, more helpful to us by pointing it at actionable, bringing actionable data to us. So what would the uh, most cost-effective areas for us to work in as a committee be? 
so that um, so I look forward to that discussion to follow. And Mr. Duval, you're certainly welcome to come back after the break if you have the time and or interest. Uh, well, I know you have the interest. I don't know if you have the time to to hear from Mr. McNamara and Mr. 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 Chair. May I also, before we break, I do I do have, as you know, a question. Please. Thank you. Uh, I, I just, it's more of a comment. I do hope we can also hear more about what Mr. Duval mentioned around consumer protection. Uh, it is disconcerting that people get these things in the mail, you know, uh, and get them committed to uh, products that have a long-term investment that are more expensive and um, uh, bad for the environment. The other piece that I'll just mention is, is you know, if, this is the emergency we all know and the crisis we all uh, are aware it is. I, it, in a way, to me, how do we change that fleet of vehicles out there as quickly as possible? And, you know, it comes down to resources. And, you know, can we make these? I mean, honestly, if this, if we were, if people were really feeling this crisis, I think people would literally be finding ways to give vehicles away and get the old vehicles off. I mean, really saying, okay, we've identified this situation and we, now in, in the real world though, are there ways for us to, you know, this is an infrastructure question and are there uh, ways for us to get the funds that will help these vehicles become so affordable that it, it's just gonna happen. This cultural change will start to happen and my, the one thing I know we've said in Senate education is we are looking for ways more than ever, given the new position that Senator Leahy is in, and I think the Biden administration's commitment to these issues to find ways to partner with our federal government and our federal partners to get these kinds of resources. So I would just, uh, I just wanted to make those comments. I mean, it's not unlike broadband and other things. These are massive infrastructure changes and, and to change out that fleet is going to take a lot of money, but it's it's a crisis, and, and and we have to do it. And I think for Vermont, in a way, to be seen as a pilot in some regards, and making that case to Leahy and the administration, uh, you know, the new Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, uh, I, I also would suspect, you know, looking for pilot programs that can really change a state and then be used in other localities in states could be huge. Right. Well, great. Well, thanks for that. And actually, um, to that point, I I just talked to the House Energy and Technology Chair Tim Briglin over the weekend about putting together a letter from uh, House and Senate uh, committees uh, to you know to Leahy's office and to the as well as to Welch and Sands, but it may be who knows exactly, anyway, to our federal delegation and figure out the best strategy for offering us up again as a living laboratory for doing this work. And to me, the, the very genuine calling card we have to say that we have, we're worth investing in is not just that it's their home state, but that we have the cleanest grid in the country to build, which is a unique asset that we have all built for five, six years running. Um, last word to you, Senator Westman. I would just um, echo support for what Brian just said. You know, well, it really comes down to how can we take low-income Vermonters that are struggling and help them move to something cleaner. They, um, they're the people with the least ability to be able to move. Right, right, right. That is the, the ultimate I don't know. Find a way to right. offer them economical I mean, used cars. Right. That's right. all they buy. Right. Well, the people, you know, create a create a subsidy to help them buy more um more yes. reasonable cars. That's a pos possible answer. Yes. Good. Right. Well, I see a lot of heads nodding, so that's definitely a moment for, for me to say that we should stop right there. Uh, no, so we actually, we, we're gonna take a break till 10 and then we'll hear from the department. Um, I see Mr. McNamara's arrived, so, uh, but I do wanna make sure that we pause rather than get locked into our chairs in an unending Zoom session, which will kill all of us eventually. So. Uh, 
We'll take a break till 10. Uh, Mr. Duval, thanks so much for coming in and um, very helpful discussion and um, look forward to continuing the conversations and we'll, we'll be hearing all those proposals um, and moving things forward. It's, happily, this is the beginning of a biennium. So we don't know how far and how fast we'll go, but um, very interested in, in changing the story, this biennium on some major energy bills. So, uh, so committee, we have a 10 minute break. You may wanna, you may wanna turn off video and mute uh, because the stream will keep running. Jude will put up a sort of a place card during the break, um, but it, it does stay live. So, <coughs> thanks again, Jared.
Who's shuffling papers and is still on there with their microphone on? We join up with NPR for live coverage from Washington. It ain't me, boss. <laughs> I'm not the boss. <laughs> no, this is Chuck Berry. That's one of the Chuck Berry's great songs. It ain't me, yep. boss. Uh-uh, boss, it ain't me. Must have been some other body. Uh-uh, boss, it ain't me. <laughs> <laughs> I've been wondering the same thing, though. Actually, I presumed it was you, Mark. <laughs> no, it, it was... Uh... <laughs> My my downfall will be that I leave the mic on someday when I didn't intend to. <laughs> oh, good lord! <laughs> yeah, I was uh, thinking. I was thinking about we the notion that we should become a we could become a laboratory on how to do stuff. Yeah, um, I've taken the, down the uh, the pause screen. Yeah, um, the way you become a laboratory is you solve a problem. And when you solve the problem, um, people run over to find out how you did it. <laughs> um, in the private sector, once you've solved the problem, you don't tell anybody until you get a damn patent on it so that other people can't come over and get your laboratory for free. Yeah. But um, you, you don't, you, the, way you become, the way you become an example for everyone else is you solve the problem. You don't sit down with the idea of let's go become the the, the lab or the uh, example and the other one was uh the, we the, are live it's okay. okay how do you do the difference between the problem that tackles us with uh automobiles and um and with homes and you know there's the expression if you find yourself uh standing in a hole what's the first thing you're supposed to do stop digging Okay, that's our problem with automobiles. Um, we're, while we're trying to solve the mileage problem, we, we're still digging because the automobiles are still being produced. With homes, the hole has already been dug and our solution is how to begin to fill them in. Yeah. Well, Mark, I'm gonna take yeah. a phone call. Yep, bye. And they're what, stopping digging and and uh, Chris and filling in the hole are completely different. Um, <coughs> it, you know, every year we don't fill in the hole with homes. We lose one year. Every year we allow new inefficient automobiles to be, we sit and watch them being sold. We're continuing to dig the hole deeper. So they're, they're two opposite. They're, they're, they have different solutions to them. And we need to, picture that and feel that when we set out to to um so when, when are we gonna when are we on our work time um so it is uh two minutes after 10 so it's time for okay. us to reconvene um and uh so i want to welcome to the committee um a department of public services come over mr mcnamara and mr uh is it peacock how do you, I want to learn to say your last name. For, That's correct. exactly right. Exactly right. Thanks. Okay. Peacock. Okay, well, great. So uh, welcome to you both. And uh, Jared Duvall was in before you and actually, uh, I think maybe unbeknownst to him, set your visit up perfectly because he said, you know, I recommend we were talking about, he did the whole energy landscape, talked about areas of opportunity, namely thermal transportation and 
Um, and then as we were swinging around towards, well, what might we be doing about it? Uh, we wanted to bring the lens of cost effectiveness to our work uh, in terms of, and I think in sort of geek speak of the lowest cost for CO2 equivalent reduced or avoided. So, uh, and I know that you folks uh, have been looking into it. So I don't want to take off the table anything that you already have in your presentation. Uh, committee members should be aware that uh, Jude has sent out to everyone the department's annual report that we just got. So thank you to the department for that. Um, I know it's a lot of work to produce and um, I hope in the end that you conclude it was worth doing because you see how it influences the work we do for the coming biennium. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn the floor over to uh, Mr. McNamara and Mr. Peacock. Great, thank you. Uh, for the record, Ed McNamara, Planning Director for Department of Public Service and Philip Peacock, a Utilities Analyst, if I'm getting the title correct, for Department of Public Service as well. Great, thanks. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so we'll be doing a quick overview of annual energy report. And actually, let me just, apologies here. Um, Are you set up for sharing? There we go. Is that showing up now? It is, thank you. Great. Okay. <clears throat> and I think we're stuck on the, um, the, the program, not the presentation view. Oh, it looks like it may be loading actually. Yeah, it's very slow at the moment. <laughs> so I'll just keep talking while this is um, hopefully working. So annual energy report is actually a, a couple of reports rolled into one. Um, overall intent is looking at the progress towards the most recent comprehensive energy plan goals. Um, Philip, can you actually try sharing your screen and see what happens there? I will, you may need to uh, stop sharing. Oh, I'll, yep. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> actually, it looks like I, I am asked to get permission. Um, thank you, Jude, Jude gave me permission. So in addition to progress towards the comprehensive energy plan goals um, included as appendices to the report are reports on the renewable energy programs, uh, mostly RES, Renewable Energy Standard, and also the Standard Offer Program. And there's a report required by Section 8010 of Title 30 on net metering that we're required to submit to the Public Utility Commission and also as part of the annual energy report. Uh, so second slide, please. <clears throat> so yeah, we're gonna be hitting all these topics here, basically an overview of the CEP. Uh, Philip will be talking about, uh, I'm sorry, I'll touch on um, carbon emissions at a broad level. Philip will talk about a model that he's worked on We'll also talk about household energy spending, and then I'll walk through progress in the electric sector, thermal sector, turn it back to Philip for transportation, <coughs> excuse me, and then I will cover the renewable energy programs report and the net metering report. Great. And just for, for your knowledge and the committee, uh, it just says 10, 10 a.m. start, but we have no other witnesses scheduled for the morning, so we really want to take our time to... Um, Go, don't feel like you have to rush through the report at all. And, um, and there'll be, and also so we have plenty of time for committee discussion as things come up along the way. Thanks. Sounds great, thank you. So next slide, please. I think folks are generally familiar with this. Um, the CEP has an overall goal of 90% renewable by 2050 with some interim goals for 2335, sorry, 2035 and 2025. The significant component of that, <clears throat> excuse me, in addition to adding renewables is also reducing consumption. Energy efficiency is often referred to as sort of the first fuel. Um, so overall we need to reduce consumption 
and I'm not seeing all of it right here. Um, then there's sector specific goals as well, 67% renewable by 2025, which we're just about there. Thermal sector, 30% renewable by 2025, just about there. And transportation, 10% by 2025. That's the most problematic. Um, there's also greenhouse gas goals as well, um, somewhat obviated or actually rolled into the Global Warming Solutions Act as well. Next slide, please. Um, Mr. McNamara, can I ask you a quick question so we can remind us all? Um, the CEP is the framework we've been working with maybe one of the, the longest uh, on, on energy goals, uh, but the goals listed for the most part there, can you just help us understand to what degree we're you know, really obligated to make those uh, targets versus they are suggestions from ourselves to ourselves about what a, a good path forward would look like. Okay. Yep, great question, thank you. Um, so I distinguish between goals and requirements. So the goals are something that in 2016, um, the Department of Public Service established this 90 by 2050 goal. It was never codified in statute. It's never become, there's no statutory goal and there's definitely no statutory requirement. It is something that the department strives for when we look at utilities, integrated lease cost plans, integrated resource plans. <clears throat> when we look at um, 248 applications, generation, um, transmission, how does this, how do all these different moving parts fit within that 90 by 2050 goal. The distinction though is the greenhouse gases were a goal up until this past July, I believe, um, in which case greenhouse gas reduction is now a requirement. And I apologize, I don't know off the top of my head of how consistent the CEP greenhouse gas reduction goals are with the GWSA reduction requirements. I believe that they're, if not the same, very consistent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So while we're talking about greenhouse gas reductions, <clears throat> um, Department of Environmental Quality under Agency of Natural Resources is responsible for preparing a, a GHG inventory. And they've been doing that pretty much every year for the last several years. Um, talking to the folks at DEC, there was some data issues they were not able to release the inventory to date. Um, so we still have 2016 data. There's a lot of lag in a lot of the data. They're trying to, they're pulling a lot more data even than we are in this annual energy report, um, which accounts for some of this lag. So what we have here is actually two slides that are very similar or that are exactly the same as what I presented last year. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the top left, this is 2016 carbon emissions in Vermont. Um, by sector. Transportation is far and away the largest sector or contributor. Um, residential commercial fuel use, I think of that as essentially thermal, um, second. Agriculture is third and electricity is fourth. Um, so that was 2016. Keep in mind 2016 was pre-renewable energy standard requirements. So the department last year did a quick analysis. Um, it's not the official analysis at all. That's DEC's job. <clears throat> but we, we expect that electricity is around 2% of carbon emissions now, and transportation and thermal have gone up. On the bottom right is a comparison. This is again from 2016 that compares Vermont to U.S. emissions. So you can see we're actually higher than the rest of the U.S. on a per capita basis when it comes to agriculture. Um, when it comes to transportation, we're significantly higher and also thermal residential commercial fuel use for electricity, we're actually substantially lower than most of the rest of the country. And it kind of makes sense. Um, it's cold and it's rural, we drive a lot compared to a lot of other areas. So that I think that accounts for most of the explanation as to why we 
different sectors have the different relative contributions to GHG emissions. If there's any questions about that, I'm gonna, if not, I'm gonna turn it over to Philip to talk about a model that he created. Thanks, Ed. So uh, State of Vermont has a number of uh, mechanisms, measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And some of them we all know about, you know, energy efficiency programs, uh, tier three energy transformation programs that are managed through the distribution utilities, uh, the state EV incentive, for example. Um, there are some others, certainly any support of public transit, supporting walking and biking, uh, also reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But um, I'm going to focus just on that first category uh, because we have typically pretty good numbers, um, good estimates of how much those actions cost and also their, we can calculate their greenhouse gas savings over time. So a little over a year ago, the department created this model called the cost of saving carbon uh, model. It's really just an Excel tool intended to compare the net economic cost or benefit of the measures we know and, and really work with every day um, compared to the expected greenhouse gas, uh, I should really just say just CO2 savings of those measures over their lifetimes. So the measures um, are listed at the bottom there and you can, you can see their, their lifetimes. Um, and when I say economic cost, it's not speaking just to the participants, that is to say that the EV driver or the uh, uh, homeowner who gets their home weatherized. Um, we, it's it's a, imagine if you draw a, a boundary around Vermont and say that that is the economic, uh, that that's the boundaries of the economic benefit. So it could be um, certainly the participant, it could be the rate payers, uh, you know, other customers, the same electric utility, it could be taxpayers. But Vermont as a whole uh, is the uh, geographic space, if you would, for the economic uh, cost or benefit calculated. For the lifetime reduction of CO2, um, in some cases it's pretty straightforward because uh, let's say you're shifting from a, uh, you know, from, from one electric, uh, one fossil fuel technology, you know, traditional car to a uh, electric vehicle. So the fossil fuel that's uh, avoided is straightforward. You know how much carbon is in a, a gallon of gasoline. Um, and then for these, uh, the penalty switching to electricity, we model out what will the electricity grid be in terms of carbon intensity over that measure's lifetime. So um, you know, 12 years for an EV, uh, for tier two resources such as solar, it's, it's 20 years. And we're counting, we're start, starting basically from 2019 data in which the grid was 93% fueled by non-carbon resources. So that's renewables and nuclear. And based on contracts, based on the renewable energy standard, we expect the grid to be uh, close to 100% non-carbon around 2030. So over 20 years, the next 20 years, the, the second half of that uh, electricity is contributing very little or no greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, can we pause just for a moment on that? Um, so the net present value estimate for the cost or benefit. Um, it, I just wanna make sure that we're all thinking of that the same way. So my, my simple way of thinking about it is, it's not only uh, you have to think about if you put money into an EV or something like that, um, you have to, in order to accomplish a certain end, like saving money and uh, maybe reducing your emissions. Uh, you also have to think about what if you took the same amount of money and made a sort of an average rate of return by putting it in a CD or something like that, right? Like you, the money, it's not that the money, you need to, to discount <laughs> your savings by what you could have done with that money otherwise. Is that the, the concept? Yes. Yeah. So let's say that that electric electric vehicle is, is a little bit more expensive than an equivalent internal combustion vehicle. So, um, you know, you, you would be spending that much more upfront and uh, reaping the benefits, you know, in terms of lower fuel costs, lower operational costs over that vehicle's lifetime. So um, greater upfront cost, but it, it will pay back. Okay. Um, uh, to some degree. Then, 
And we also assign the 3% discount rate. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, HPWH, just wanna make sure I know what that is. I, I do spell it out on the next slide, heat pump water heater. Okay, thank you. So um, this was presented last year and this year, um, there are a few changes uh, just reflecting uh, general changes to our electric grid. In some cases, uh, reflecting that uh, fossil fuel prices have fallen since last year, um, you know, beginning last March with the beginning of the pandemic. And you know, as we see with gas prices, they've recovered some, some degree, but for the most part, the, the results look similar to last year. And just for orientation, um, these measures, that are to the left of the zero uh, line, what to the left of the origin, are uh, are actually not net costs but net benefits. Speaking from an economic sense, for the whole of Vermont. So again, not just for the the individual who goes and, and purchases a heat pump water heater, but um, for Vermont as a whole. And so um, I would I would caution that there is not necessarily a great deal of precision. In this type of estimate, because you're you're really taking averages, and um, you know every, each each use case will be different. So rather, I would I would look at this type of chart not as a ranking, but as a a general sense of. And so um, you know, starting at the top, you, you do see that um, actions like uh, you know, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle and all electric vehicle. Um, generally have uh, a net economic benefit um, and uh, are also, you know, saving carbon because that's really, you know, the unit of this is cost uh, per ton of carbon saved. So um, similarly, residential weatherization comes in, you know, very close to the origin at, at $16, it doesn't even show up. And I should note that we do normally assign values that are not necessarily captured in this analysis. So for re residential weatherization, we know that there are health and, uh, and safety benefits to having a home weatherized. Um, sorry, those Mr. benefits Peacock, are very assist. Mr. Peacock, sure. is it just me or are you in and out a bit, quite a bit? Is it my computer for everyone or is it? Yeah, I'm having a little trouble too. It's okay. breaking up a bit. Thank um, you. I suppose yeah, I'm losing the sound. I lose the um, sound from time to time. Maybe okay. you could uh, turn off your video. Sometimes that cures it for us. Sure, Thank I will you. do that. Unfortunately, there's not much I can do uh, in terms of my internet connection otherwise. Right. Um, so. so I was just speaking, is that any better audio? So far, so good. Okay. So speaking to residential weatherization and the way that uh, we, in the real world, we assign um, a, a value to the health and safety benefits that come with having a home weatherized. I wanna note that, that this analysis does not include that only because we don't have similar numbers for health and safety for all these other measures. And so to be uh, more fair and more comparable, we don't include that, uh, that particular value. You know, in general, I would point out that um, the, the, the measures uh, that, that we have in the state um, that address transportation, that offset fossil fuels directly, either in transportation or uh, say in the case of weather, weatherization, offset fossil fuels consumed at home, um, tend to come out best in this type of analysis. And then some of the more expensive items, expensive up front, such as transit buses, uh, such as electric school buses, um, look less desirable, largely because although there are fossil fuel savings, they are more, much more expensive to purchase up front. There are also brand new technologies in the sense of six years ago, you could not purchase an electric school bus. And now you have four or five manufacturers making electric school buses. And so we expect that the price will come down or will be more comparable to a, a diesel fossil fuel bus uh, in time. Okay. Um, can I, a, a quick question on setting the origin, uh, you know, at the value uh, at zero. 
Um, do you, have you analyzed sort of the appropriateness of uh, shifting it basically to the right sort of a, well, I'm thinking that if you include a social cost for carbon, does that, let me just ask it as a question, does it shift the line to the right so that there's savings for more of the measures uh, because the, the origin shifts right? It would. And the social cost of carbon is not included in this analysis uh, in part, part to avoid uh, you know, creating a conflict with, with that exact question, which is where and how would you value it? I didn't have a, a single number to, to value right at $40 a ton, $100 a ton. And so I left it out so that if you want to, exactly as you say, Chair McRae, you could draw a line at you know, some value and um, you know, additional measures look either uh, cost neutral or uh, cost advantaged. Okay. And I'm guessing that you wouldn't <laughs> encourage anyone to look at this and say, well, then all our money should go into electrical energy efficiency portfolio. Um, but it, you know, when you, that, that could be someone's reaction to this. You'd say, wow, that's tenfold the next nearest measure at plug-in hybrid electrics. Um, so how do you, how do you encourage people to think about this chart in terms of not having say, well, pour all your money into the top most measure because it's the most cost effective? I would say from a policy perspective, greenhouse gas reduction is not our sole objective in the sense of we also do value um, the health and safety benefits that come with, with certain of these measures. We do value the economic development and jobs contribution to the state of Vermont that certain policies can, can add. Um, so this is, it's really just one lens. It should not be the only lens with which to view these measures. Uh, I would Chair, also point out in the case of electric, oh. Uh, Mr. Chair. Senator, sorry, Senator McDonald. Anytime our witnesses that are well qualified and work on that tell us things like, well, you could measure it on cost effective or on uh, social uh, health benefits or economy and jobs. It would be really neat and clever to grade them on all three of those things. So we have some, some perspective um, of how the, the three areas we have to consider are, are valued compared to one another. So, I mean, I, that's, was interest, interesting to hear and, and, um, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but it was, a good, it was a good question and how they grade on those three things is, we ought to be able to find a way to learn that. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that you're, I agree. And I think we all, you know, I like the way Mr. Picot says it, it's a single lens and we know we have to bring multiple perspectives to the issue. And I think one of the things we'll keep working with the department with uh, is to how to create that integrated vision that helps us identify opportunities. So thank you. Uh, Philip, if I can interrupt for a second too, I think another important aspect of this as well is the reason you don't wanna focus just on electric efficiency is from a carbon reduction standpoint, you need to focus on where the carbon emissions are. So the transportation and thermal. So it's depending on what, what goals you want to achieve. But from my perspective, you ought to be focused much more on the transportation and thermal in order to achieve the GWSA requirements and to address climate crisis more generally. Which we, we call the Willie Sutton factor. Sorry, I don't get that reference. <laughs> it's a bank robber. They asked him why he robbed banks and then because that's where the money was. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Chairman Bray, if I can go back to your to your particular point about electric efficiency, um, yeah. you know, electric efficiency programs offer lots of benefits to the state. But as the grid gets cleaner and our electricity get purchases uh, get you know, more renewable, less carbon intensive over time, um, the specific greenhouse gas savings that can be attributed to electric efficiency decrease each year. Right. 
Right. Thanks. And uh, you're reminding me, I think maybe it was two years ago, uh, Jared Duval was in and said, imagine you were trying to get juice out of three fruits. And I think the smallest was, uh, well, especially with the grid these days, the smallest might be a grape. Then the next one was something like an orange. The next one was something like a grapefruit. And he said, no matter how well you squeeze that grape, you know, there's not much juice in there to get out. And that's our electric sector these days in terms of carbon emissions. So we'll concentrate on oranges and um, grapefruits. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right, sorry for the interruption. Thank you, let's keep going. Sure, so we're gonna move away from cost of carbon at the moment. And um, I'm just gonna share the results of, of something we worked on uh, in the fall, which is just to look at the way that um, spending on different fuels and uh, fuels at different prices, really electricity at different prices impacts household spending. Um, and this was not a detailed analysis. The intent was just to get a sense for our purposes of how a household approaches uh, the, the, you know, their pocketbook side of spending on energy. And for simplicity, we, we keep the common categories of electricity, thermal, and transportation. So this, uh, this chart shows for an average Vermont home that, that's purchasing um, you know, 60, 600 kilowatt hours a year, how the different price of electricity impacts their total expenditures. Um, the low, lowest electricity rate, this is 2019 data, is it for customers of uh, Orleans Village Electric Department. Um, and the highest is for customers of Washington Electric Co-op. And so even though this make-believe home is, is using the same amount of electricity, how much that household would pay um, really varies depending on which territory they live in. For thermal, we wanted to look at the, the different cost of fuels. Um, and this, this data is from um, mid-December. So it does reflect that uh, fuel oil, for example, is, is less costly this year than last year. Um, so categories are, are for natural gas, uh, number two fuel oil, and propane um, in both a, an average home uh, for Vermont as a whole uh, as well as uh, a home that has seen 23% savings through weatherization activities. Uh, and that 23% is, is based on work that's been done in the past that shows on average, a home through cost-effective measures can uh, realize a 23% savings. So it's not necessarily intensive tearing, you know, tearing a, a house down to its studs to, to re-insulate, it's taking actions that are um, less intensive. But again, you're seeing that um, you know, customers who are in natural gas territory can, and use natural gas uh, are paying less than Vermonters who don't have that access. A major category of thermal that I didn't include just due to the complexity is electric heat pumps, um, which uh, I think there may be a slide on later, but, but definitely should be a consideration and a recognition that a large share of home heating in many homes can be served by electric heat pumps. And lastly, for transportation fuel spending, um, we're looking at different fuels again. Uh, really, I'm gonna start on the, the right, this top right box of regular gasoline, which in mid-December was 2.15 a gallon. It's a little bit more now. Um, versus electricity rates um, that are, uh, will vary by electric utility. And uh, as Jared Duvall said earlier, some electric utilities offer even more advantageous discounted EV rates um, in exchange for you know, control over timing during electric grid peaks or charging during certain hours of the day and, and not charging during other hours of the day. Um, so the average electricity rate at the equivalent of 180 a gallon of gasoline would be for Vermont as a whole. Um, but the 129 is Green Mountain Power's EV rate uh, and the 234 is the, uh, the residential electricity for Washington Electric Co-op, which um, is, as I mentioned earlier, the highest in the state. Um, so looking at just at the, you know, this 
uh, on the left side, this multicolored bar for average community, this is um, assuming a household VMT of about 23,000 miles per year, which is higher than Jared Duvall's slide earlier, which showed uh, per capita, but this is intended not to reflect per capita, but overall household driving mileage so that it's household spending. And you can see that between this um, gold, gold bar, uh, median green, light green, and harvest gold, um, how much you're, you're paying to charge your EV does have a big impact um, on your household spending and how it compares favorably or unfavorably to driving an electric, uh, excuse me, a gasoline vehicle. Lastly, um, just at the bottom, you know, high density and low density, these are communities. We wanted to show that uh, although households in Vermont, they range from spending you know, $0 on gasoline for a, a household that doesn't drive up to um, you know, $3,000 a year for a household that drives a lot. We want to just show that uh, taking an average for say uh, a whole community, uh, it does vary depending on if you're in a high density community um, where, where VMT is, is lower, such as Barry City is the example I chose, or if you're in a, a rural low density community such as Bakersfield. Any questions about uh, these slides about household fuel spending? Um, I don't see any hands. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, putting it all together, uh, this was intended to show that, uh, you know, how much a household spends, let's say, you know, the most common case, which is this top bar spending $4,327 a year um, from, from all, all those three sources, you know, it can, it can vary depending if you're a, a, a low mile, low mileage driver in natural gas territory or a high mileage driver, um, let's say paying, paying for propane uh, as, as the most expensive thermal fuel. And with that, I'll hand it back to Ed. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. Um, I think you actually have one more slide. The next slide, 10. So, no. uh, just okay. Mr. Chair. Yeah, Senator McDonald. Um, that was an interesting comparison on the last thing, but it for vehicles, it, it dealt with electric cars and what they cost to operate, but it ignored um, the repairs that electric vehicles need or don't need, um, and that that often gets left out. So I'm ready to go on to the next one, but it's incomplete in a comparison there. Thank you. Thank you. Right. I mean, it's focused right on the energy, purchased energy to operate, but not necessarily the equipment costs or savings for op, uh, whatever ongoing yeah, yeah, maintenance. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, you know, you, you op, operate an automobile, particularly when it's used, you spend money on fuel and you spend money on repairs. So, um, okay, repairs were left out and that's an important um, plus for uh, electric vehicles. Okay, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so we included the household spending just to get a general sense of what Vermonters are paying. Um, Efficiency Vermont also did an energy burden study in 2019 that I think is very useful as well for folks to look at. Um, but moving on from sort of that place setting is how do we achieve the 90 by 2050 goals? How do we achieve the interim goals? And I've lumped these into two different categories. On the left, demand reduction, so first fuel. Um, electric efficiency in the electric sector, Efficiency Vermont, Burlington Electric Department have been doing really good work for quite a few years on that. Um, weatherization, we have lots of different organizations. Uh, efficiency Vermont does some, Vermont Gas, 
Office of Economic Opportunity um, <clears throat> that helps host the weatherization programs as well, low income weatherization. And then the last is reduced vehicle miles traveled, um, bicycle and pedestrian programs, carpooling, um, even increasing the overall efficiency of internal combustion and um, engines. These all help to reduce the overall energy demand on one side. Another important consideration too, um, as we move to electrification, sorry, electrification, if you look at an electric vehicle, an internal combustion engine is inherently inefficient. It requires combustion, a uh, lot of waste heat. And so the amount of energy to power an electric vehicle compared to um, internal combustion engine, it's a lot less for the electric vehicle, total amount of energy used. Uh, same for a heat pump compared to an oil fired unit. So EVs and heat pumps have two different benefits. One is depending on the fuel provided, you know, depending on the utility, the host utilities, power supply portfolio, it can be renewable. It also reduces, those measures also reduce the overall energy consumption in Vermont as well. The other electrification sort of measure that I put up here has been up until this year, one of the most common line extensions. And this was the low hanging fruit for the tier three uh, renewable energy standard requirement. Especially in Vermont Electric Co-op service territory, they were able to find a fair number of sawmills and sugaring operations that operated completely on diesel generators. And by bringing electric lines to them and enabling them to switch over from diesel to electric motors, uh, saving hundreds of thousands of gallons of diesel fuel a year for several of these operations. Those, that low hanging fruit is mostly gone. Um, I believe later on I'll talk about overall tier three measures. Primarily heat pumps is what is being um, put into place. But the electrification is one of the main goals. Related to that is load management. I think I've talked about this for this committee before of what we don't want to have happen is on a really cold day in January, have everybody come home, plug in their EVs, turn up the heat pump a little bit, just as the sun is setting. So the solar on the roof or something is no longer providing electricity. So then you have a peak load that keeps increasing, that increases the infrastructure costs as well. To the extent that you can minimize the peak load, spread the kilowatt hours associated with charging the EV and the use of the heat pump, spread that around to the extent possible, you can lower overall costs as we move to electrification or a more electrified economy. <clears throat> and then the final aspect is developing renewable supply. And that can be, you know, again, an EV or a heat pump is considered renewable to the extent that the utility's power supply is renewable. Um, can be biomass, especially well for the thermal sector. And obviously solar, wind, hydro um, for the electric sector. One of the most important components though is lease cost planning. How do we achieve this new renewable supply at lowest cost? You need to look at the overall cost of, or you need to look at the relative costs of different power supply options. Next slide, please. Um, Mr. McNamara, a quick question on load management. Um, to just briefly, can you say something about to what degree our current grid supports flexible load management versus we need infrastructure investment, for instance, fiber to the premises um, in order to have the bandwidth and the connections necessary to uh, make meaningful gains on the load management side of things. Yep. So the load management programs put in place so far um, rely on the customer's broadband for, and it doesn't require fiber. The programs, um, the communications requirements are not significant, but they do need to be reliable and it can't be 
you could probably, and this is actually, I'm not even going to say, I'm not sure whether DSL is sufficient. So much more universal broadband is going to be necessary. What you're talking about also raises issues of energy equity of if somebody in, I live in Montpelier, I have access to all of the GMP programs. If I wanted to do load management, if I can get an EV and then do their load management to reduce my EV charging costs, um, I'm able to do that. I've got good broadband here. If you go out even just a couple miles north of here, still GMP service territory, they might, some folks don't have that same access to the same programs. So that's one of the issues that we need to think about. It's not a very clear cut. Um, yes, you absolutely, things start to get a little bit squishy, especially when you try to do a cost benefit analysis when it comes to energy equity. But it is something that for lots of different reasons, we need a more expanded, affordable and reliable broadband um, in Vermont. Great, thanks. I just uh, I just wanted to make sure we touched on it in passing because I know that there are other people who are focused on broadband from the perspective of telehealth, tele you know telemedicine, uh, remote education, and remote work. But for the evolving energy system, it also has an important role to play. Yep, thanks. absolutely. Um, Slide 13, please. So one of the overall organizations uh, structure that we had for the CEP or the annual energy report um, is breaking it out by sector and then within the sector talking about reduction in demand and supply. Um, and that's just because that's how we try to think about addressing issues. First, how do you reduce demand and then adding renewable supply. So here you've got two charts showing um, Efficiency Vermont and, the, and Burlington Electric Department, the two electric efficiency utilities. <clears throat> Simply shows the amount of energy efficiency and the savings it's achieved from energy efficiency compared to if we just were going out and buying more power on the grid or developing additional generation to meet that load. Um, slide. 14, please. And then this just shows the budgets. Um, so we're doing some really good work. We're also spending a fair amount of money, about $45.5 million a year uh, for Efficiency Vermont and 2.6, 2.7 million for Burlington Electric. Um, Again, this is investments that are reducing overall costs and reducing consumption as well. <clears throat> Just wanted to make sure that folks see both sides of the picture though. Um, slide 15, please. So moving to the electric supply. On the left, this is the actual physical generation. Um, we've talked before in this committee about renewable energy credits versus energy. So megawatt hour for each, um, one rec is equal to one megawatt hour. On the left-hand side, that pie chart is the, the energy, the megawatt hours. And you can see, so this shows where our electric utilities collectively, each utility is a little bit different. Um, Burlington and Washington Electric Co-op are gonna look very different and Swan are gonna look very different. Um, because GMP is 75 to 80% of the state, this is largely weighted towards GMP's power supply portfolio. So in terms of energy, um, solar, almost all behind the meter is about a little over 8%. Hydro-Quebec is 24%. Hydro, <clears throat> excuse me, that's both in-state um, and some in New York some in the rest of New England, uh, some biomass, which is primarily Rygate and McNeil, and then the wind projects, which we have a decent amount in here. Also, uh, Burlington Electric has a contract with a um, wind project in Massachusetts as well. GMP has a project, uh, contract with a wind project in New Hampshire. I believe those are still current. <clears throat> and then nuclear. Um, 
this is at this point this is primarily seabrook although there's a small amount of millstone which is the only other remaining nuclear unit in new england that's located in connecticut so that's the physical energy on the right hand when, side is after question, you, please on seabrook um when is seabrook licensed uh to operate until Good question. I believe it's 2034 or so, but I'm not positive. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The right hand pie chart um, shows what happens is GIS's generator information system. Um, it's how wrecks are tracked. And so the right hand side shows the power supply portfolio once wrecks are actually retired to meet res compliance. Large portion of that is met with Hydro-Quebec. Um, a decent amount is also met with other hydro um, in state and out of state. <clears throat> and then solar, um, that 2%, 2.12 represents tier two of the renewable energy standard. System mix is some component where the utilities are not obligated to meet 100% res, so system mix, ISO New England, um, whatever happens to be producing primarily natural gas is represented by this system mix uh, uh, wedge. And then nuclear, again, is roughly 27% of the remaining. Okay. Uh, can I ask a quick question on solar? So it drops from 8.3 to 2.1. So there's 6.2% 6 6 that's not there, what's the fate generally of the 6.2% of solar that's not actually being held in certificates? Yep. So this gets to the structure of the renewable energy standard. Um, tier two is re tier two of the res is requiring that, I think it's around 2% um, of total retail sales be met with distributed under five megawatts located in Vermont and built after July 15th, or sorry, July, 2015. So there's a fair amount of solar that was built before that. Um, some of those wrecks are being sold. Some of the wrecks, especially net metering 1.0, um, the net metering that was in place prior to the PUC's change in the net metering program, it's really unclear what happened with those wrecks. Uh, there's some, some of those are definitely being sold in the pool GIS. We can see that some it's just, they're not being counted one way or the other. And there's also the way that tier two is structured. Um, it's not really a liquid market the same way you can go out and buy wrecks from Maine. You could go out and buy wrecks from other places because tier two is structured to be small located in Vermont and built after 2015, July, 2015, <clears throat> the utilities were concerned that there were, they were not gonna have enough tier two wrecks. So a fair number of utilities invested in building out um, solar projects in advance of the tier two requirement coming into place. That coincided with a drop in solar prices, uh, net metering staying, compensation staying relatively similar or not declining with that declining cost, and therefore seeing a giant, a really large spike in the amount of net metering as well. So we're over procured for the amount of solar needed to meet tier two. Sorry, that was a very long winded explanation. Well, thanks. No, I, <laughs> it's something well just need to be aware of. And I know there's more to the story even than that too, thanks. Or well, I suspect there's more to the story. One of the great things about this job, there's always another layer to the onion. So, yeah. um, slide 16, please, Philip. This is just a graphic. Um, Res compliance, so 2% of tier, two percent of retail sales, tier two, 66% um, tier one, 
And that's essentially tier one is a, we'll get to this a little bit later, but tier one is as long as it's renewable and delivered into New England, it counts. It doesn't matter the vintage. It can be a hundred year old dam in um, Maine. It can be Hydro-Quebec. It can be anything or sorry, not quite anything. Um, and the utilities actually retired more than necessary to meet compliance. Um, so 66% is a little bit more than needed to meet um, res. But you can see on a statewide basis, only about 32% is not renewable. And again, getting to that nuclear, um, nuclear, according to pretty much most of the New England states, I think all of them, uh, nuclear is considered zero carbon. So it's considered sort of clean, but not renewable. So from a GHG emissions perspective, it helps reduce overall carbon. Um, so just so I keep updating my own knowledge on this one, uh, the RES, I don't, I haven't kept quite track of the actual increments. I don't know if we were supposed to be at 62 or 63 by the end of 2020, but you're saying by the end of 2020, uh, our utilities were actually at 66. They, they're ahead of pace. That's correct. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Next slide, please. Well, actually, any questions about the electric sector before I move to thermal? Okay. Not hearing any. Um, slide 18. <clears throat> One of the things that um, somebody at the department did, which was great, and I really appreciate that they did this, is they actually looked at heating degree days and then compared that to fuel usage just to show significant variability. You can see here, and it's sort of common sense, but it's nice to have a graph. When it's really cold, you know, if you have a very cold winter, you're going to use a lot more fuel oil, propane, natural gas than a very mild winter. And so this essentially is showing what's happened over the last several winters um, and showing that you know, when it's really cold, you use a lot more, you use a lot more fossil fuel, a lot, lot more heating fuel overall. Um, so, and that's, I included that just to make sure people are aware year by year variations, especially in the thermal sector, um, are less important than the overall trend. If you have one really cold winter, you shouldn't be saying everything we're doing has been wiped out. You know, we're not accomplishing anything. And the same way, if you have a very mild winter, you can't claim success of look how great we're doing. We barely sold any fuel oil this year. It needs to be looking at the trends overall over time. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this graph simply shows the different weatherization providers, um, Efficiency Vermont, BED, does not do much weatherization and that's because of the regulatory structure. Almost all of Burlington Electric's um, buildings, Vermont Gas provides the heat and there is a regulatory prohibition from essentially double dipping. If VGS is, if it's a VGS eligible customer for weatherization purposes, they can't also use Burlington Electric Department money as well. So just wanted to make clear why BED's line is so small there. Um, Vermont Gas also provides their an EEU, an energy efficiency utility. OEO is the weatherization programs and 3E Thermal um, sorry, I'm blanking at the moment on exactly how they fit in with all this, but again, they provide weatherization services as well. <clears throat> One of the things I did, unfortunately did not include this um, this year, but there's an overall goal of um, weatherizing 80,000 homes. And I'm forgetting the date, it's coming up relatively soon. We're not gonna meet that goal. This is again, a goal, not a requirement. But we are not on pace to weatherize the number of whole homes set in, I believe the statute is 10 BSA 581. Right. I think it may be it was 80,000 homes by 2020, if I'm remembering. 
That does sound right. I just didn't want to. Yeah, it's relatively soon. But either way, we're not there. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so this, this simply shows relative proportions, natural gas, um, about 25% of energy, fuel oil, 30, propane, about 19, and then renewable. So that's the left-hand pie chart on the right. Most of the renewable energy in the thermal sector is cordwood, wood stoves. Most people are not using wood stoves as their primary source of heat. I know quite a few who do, but um, it's cordwood uh, and wood stoves are typically a supplemental. And so they're helping reduce the fuel oil, propane, natural gas use as well. And then in addition, you have wood chips. A lot of large uh, education institutions put in wood chip heating um, a couple of years ago. You have wood pellets as well. These can be wood pellet stoves, the individual. It can also be wood pellet boilers. Uh, these are, you know, they have a hopper for four tons or so, can run for two to three weeks um, be between cleanings, can essentially act just like a normal boiler. Renewable electricity is essentially the heat pumps and the, that portion of the heat pumps met with renewable electric um, generation as well. So you can't count all of the usage associated with heat pump as renewable. You can only count, so for Vermont, 68% um, of the heat pumps usage as renewable. The rest is essentially um, system power or nuclear. It's not really new. It's not renewable unless, of course, you're in Washington Electric, Swanton, or Burlington Electric uh, service territory. Each of those are 100% renewable. Next slide, please. <laughs> slightly different take. Um, if you look at these percentages, they're not going to add to 100. They're actually going to add to over 100. And that, again, gets to uh, a lot of folks have wood stoves in addition to natural gas, propane, um, or oil. And so predominantly, it's folks using oil. That's declining over time, um, natural gas increased for a little bit. Propane definitely increased when propane, propane prices were significantly lower than oil. That switched since then. And wood pellets have um, increased a fair amount as well. Next slide, please. Just want to give a sense of relative costs as well. <clears throat> so this chart here shows natural gas and this gets to what Philip talked about before. Natural gas is relatively inexpensive compared to other heating options. Um, so essentially natural gas and then cordwood, heating oil. Um, and this is a snapshot in time, November, 2020. This is not long-term trends that we expect to see. We're not trying to forecast out prices with this. Just saying in November, 2020, here's what people could expect to pay over the next several months for this winter period. And are they better off with natural gas or cordwood compared to kerosene, propane, uh, electric resistance heat? So again, not a forecast and not saying that heating oil is always going to be slightly less expensive than cold climate heat pumps. Um, Mr. McNamara, is there a version of this chart um, that shows, I, and I'm not sure how you even quite say this, the total cost for each fuel type. I mean, it would add in something like impacts on public health and sort of a social cost of carbon factor. So this is what, how much you have to open up your wallet to go get fuel, but there's negative externalities related to all these. And I don't know that they are brought into anyone's consciousness when they make these choices, which goes back to our discussion before you, uh, when you were arriving about short-term versus long-term thinking on fuel choices. Um, but I didn't know if there's any chart kind of like this that, that shows you the full cost um, related to fuel choices. 
as opposed to consumer cost. Yep. I'm sure that there's charts um, available out there. I have not, I've not seen one. Part of the issue becomes how do you define the social cost of carbon? How do you, how do you quantify um, health benefits as well? And people can have widely varying estimates that's why I've tended to stay away from those and instead just have the clear narrative, um, which thank you for raising that point. I should have raised it proactively. Um, there are definitely health benefits to using a heat pump. Um, if Vermonters continue to switch to more and more heat pumps, there's an overall benefit to Vermonters from a climate perspective, obviously, and also from a health perspective as well. Right. And you well, also I'm get gonna, into, yeah. sorry, you sorry. also get into interesting issues of um, cordwood. So I just put in a very efficient uh, wood stove. And as a result, my air quality inside my house, at least until I got the hang of using that new wood stove, um, got demonstrably worse than it was <laughs> when I had a, a junky old one I could throw whatever I wanted in and it would just burn. Uh, so, <clears throat> so you need to account for all the different um, health aspects of this. Right. Well, and I want to make sure you're not feeling picked on at all by that question. I know that the committee has wrestled with this for years, you know, like what math could we develop that allow the legislature, the department, the PUC and others to all operate using the same math for evaluating the relative attractiveness or value of any particular energy choice that we're all making. And so we'll see the Act 62 report requested of the PUC to help us make progress on that math. And, and we're gonna be uh, hearing from the PUC on Friday. So we'll, we'll see what, we'll learn more then, thanks. Yep. Um, I'll also point out, too, that the next comprehensive energy plan is due 2022, so January of 2022. So we've already started some work and thinking about some of the modeling, and um, we'll be doing a fair amount as well on that. So I think there's another opportunity to have that discussion. Great. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> This simply gets to, again, the prices among different um, heating options. And this is looking at a house that's fuel oil only. And then if 40% of the heat is provided by a heat pump, the remaining 60% is still by uh, used, using a fuel boiler or uh, furnace. And comparing the cost for a customer in Washington Electric Co-op and GMP service territories. And it's showing that overall adding a heat pump right now, there's a slight increase in overall costs. It's a higher increase in Washington Electric um, service territory, only a very slight increase in GMP service territory. Again, this is a snapshot in time. Uh, fuel oil prices are very low, not as low as they have been in the past few months, but I don't think anybody really realistically expects fuel oil to stay at this level over a 10 year period. And Philip, is there anything you want to add on this? No, I have nothing to add. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So heat pumps, uh, spending a little bit more time on those simply because it's the most, it's what, it fits in very well with the electrification and renewable goals. So heat pump sales have been increasing steadily over the last several years. And on the right is projections of heat pumps. Uh, this is from Vermont System Planning Committee. They do a load forecast uh, every three years. This is, I don't think that this is published yet, but we sort of sneaked an advanced copy. Um, so one of the things that you need to look at when you look at load forecasts is different technologies. Uh, electric vehicles are going to push up load. 
and heat pumps as well. So to understand what the load for the electric system is going to be, you need to understand heat pumps. So relatively small right now, we expect continued growth over time. One other thing I should say about heat pumps, I've been talking about it for thermal, um, mostly in the heating context, but a lot of folks are choosing heat pumps because of the flexibility. It provides the heat in the wintertime and it provides a lot of comfort in the summertime as well by, uh, through air conditioning. As we're starting to see warmer summers, um, milder winters, the heat pump effectiveness, cost effectiveness, uh, is going to be greater in the summertime and more people are gonna honestly want air conditioning in the summer as, as we continue to get hotter. Are there any overall questions or any questions on thermal sector? Otherwise I'll turn it back to Philip. Great. I think we're all set, thank you. Thanks. Mr. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Yeah, may I, may I just ask a question? Uh, of course, go ahead, please, Thanks. Senator McCormick. Thanks. Um, I had thought for many years that the, the whole, that I understood the issues around wood heat, that it's, it's uh, not isolated or, or sequestered carbon. And so that all oh, the burning of, of wood simply speeds up the carbon cycle, but it doesn't actually add uh, uh, carbon to the atmosphere. I was fairly comfortable with that. Now I'm hearing, I'm getting emails, um, you know, and of course there's a lot of garbage coming in electronically. It's probably maybe coming from the rat infested slums of cyberspace, <clears throat> but you know, at least the graphics look pretty professional that, that actually, uh, uh, wood heat is an environmental loser, that it is a, um, uh, adds too much carbon to the atmosphere. Could you just talk a little bit about that? I can talk a little bit about that. Agency of Natural Resources, really the best folks. I'll just give a sort of teaser on it though. Um, for for the, the best folks, there are definitely Agency of Natural Resources. Uh, one of the big issues is the time scale, as you said, is over the course of if you burn wood today um, sequestration happens but it might not happen for 80 years and I'm ballparking numbers pretty strongly here so if we have a goal of 2050 renewable by 2050 that 80 year life for the sequestration doesn't fit within that and so the there might be a net increase between now and 2050 in carbon emissions because of what you're burning today and you don't get the renewable benefit until after 2050. So I think in part it's how you frame the timeline for when you want the carbon reductions. But I would strongly recommend um, Agency of Natural Resources, okay. Department of Environmental Quality. Or Thank conservation. You. Sorry. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. And <laughs> the other area too related to burning wood, although I think most many of us probably enjoy the smell of a wood stove uh, when you're out walking, uh, whatever. The microparticulate emissions are unhealthy. And so the most efficient ones reduce that, but there are, there's a lot of wood burning going on that is relatively high emitting in microparticulates. Yeah. So we, we've gotten into, uh, Department of Health has been helping us look at that a little bit, but uh, it's kind of early days in terms of bringing that health cost impact into the equation. Another, another negative externality. But if I may, Mr. Chair, I just want to keep yes. reminding us that, you know, that seems to me, going back to Mr. Duval's presentation, just a small, small, small piece of our problem here in Vermont as it relates to global warming. It really is, it's transportation, 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 and even health impacts, I would say. Right, right, right. I just don't want us to, you know, more than ever, I think we need to keep our eye on that issue and really, you know, work to address it. Um, I've seen it, you know, just this, as I mentioned in the last conversation with PFOA, we want to uh, sort of go to the low hanging fruit and deal with it, be, but it's not making the impacts that it could be. Right, a good reminder.
you know, it's like uh, we <laughs> we could let the the perfect be the enemy of the good on this one easily. So. And if I could add one more aspect as well, <clears throat> to the extent that we're moving towards renewable resources and thermal and electrification, or sorry, thermal and transportation, there's not a lot of options. You don't see wood burning vehicles, for example, um, it's electrified vehicles. And so to the extent that we've got concerns about grid capacity, um, you can do flexible load management, obviously, but to the extent that you're not adding some electric load by some houses using biomass instead of a heat pump, um, that might actually help provide more headroom for electric vehicles from a grid perspective and overall system cost perspective as well. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ed. So uh, this is Philip again. I'm going to uh, keep my camera off per the chairman's advice just because of, uh, I got an occasional message that says my internet is unstable. So, um, you know, thinking about transportation, the Sorry, comprehensive energy. Uh, Mr. Picot, I just want to, I've asked plenty of questions, so I'm going to try to curb my enthusiasm a little bit. I just want to give us a heads up. We have roughly half an hour left. Thank you. So the Comprehensive Energy Plan has uh, three big goals related to transportation, which is reducing transportation energy use overall, increasing the use of renewable energy in transportation, uh, and then reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so electric vehicles uh, get a lot of attention today, understandably. It's also, uh, EVs are also very closely related to the work of the Department of Public Service. But I do wanna just caution that um, EVs are one strategy, but not the only strategy when it comes to reducing uh, transportation emissions. Um, I thought I'd start just with a, a chart of, of gas prices, as we all see when we when we drive past um, or you know the the pump. But um, just to see the volatility in the past year is sort of uh, a common level of volatility. Although definitely when the pandemic began last spring, last late winter. Um, fuel prices dropped, dropped rapidly, they have recovered uh, almost to where they were. Um, and gasoline remains the, the main uh, fuel source propelling Vermont's vehicles. This data is from 2019, so it's a, a, just a little bit old, but it's worth noting that uh, although we increasingly see electric vehicles on our roads, um, you know, plug-in hybrids are still less than a half a percent of all registered vehicles on our roads, uh, and same for all electric vehicles. Um, you know, overall, in terms of renewability, uh, the, the best estimate is that 6% of our transportation fuel is renewable. And that comes not from, in terms of majority, not from electricity, but from ethanol in gasoline. That said, um, Vermont is in the top 10 states in terms of EV market share. Uh, so EVs sell here better than they do in many other similar states. Um, and we can, we can talk about some of the reasons, but I, I thought it'd be helpful just to see, see a chart. And you know, there are expected leaders like California um, in, in terms of EV market share, but Vermont, uh, Vermont does well, especially for a, a, a rural state, rural state that contends with serious winters. And this is what the registered uh, EV count looks like. So it grows every quarter. Um, you know, I have data only through the end of June and even in that, that month of April, the quarter of April, May, June, um, you know, EV registrations ticked up by uh, uh, 155 vehicles. So, um, in, you know, EV enthusiasm continues uh, in the state. Um, that said, we're, we're at 4,000 vehicles uh, overall for EVs, which is a small portion of the 610 uh, registered vehicles on our roads in total. But looking out to the future, we, we do see significant uh, continued growth. This is a chart, this is an estimate prepared by Drive Electric Vermont um, for Velco. So really the, the ultimate goal was to help electric system planning to try and understand how many EVs we'll have on our roads and therefore uh, you know, interacting in some way with the electric grid. Um, and you know, if you just take 
I, I think the, the blue line for low is probably unlikely. Um, I would say, you know, certainly medium or even the high case or, or more likely as we see more and more auto manufacturers coming out with EVs, electrifying their fleets. Um, we're seeing some states uh, deciding that after 2030 or 2035, they will no longer allow gasoline vehicles to be sold in their state. Uh, as Senator McDonald pointed out earlier this morning, it takes a long time for those EV sales to sort of, uh, you know, or those, those new vehicle sales to uh, take over and, and, and be a, a large portion of all vehicles in the state's fleet, uh, you know, 10, 12 years. But uh, you can imagine the grid, electric grid implications of this. Um, and I can say, you know, that's one of the main things that Velco as the state electric grid operator is planning for. Any questions about transportation? All set, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Earlier I mentioned um, that we have, in addition to the annual energy report, um, we include in that a renewable energy programs report that's required every year and then also every other year. Um, basically, how well are we doing with the RES renewable energy standard? How are we doing with compliance? How are we doing with costs? So I'll quickly go to uh, slide 32. <clears throat> uh, again, quick overview, tier one, 55%, um, I believe in 2019, these are 2019 numbers, um, and 2% for tier two. So vast majority of tier one compliance was with Hydro-Quebec um, and pretty much almost all of it was met with hydro. NIPA is New York Power Authority. Those are the Niagara and St. Lawrence um, facilities that Vermont receives power from, <clears throat> excuse me, hydro. There's about hundred megawatts of hydro in state. We have about 200 megawatts on the Connecticut River. A lot of hydro in New England overall. Um, very small amount of biomass and a very small amount of solar. Uh, but again, hydro has basically been the tier one compliance tool. For tier two, uh, it's almost entirely solar. About half of tier two is met with net metering. Under the net metering, uh, I think it's section 8010 and also the PUC's net metering rule, net metering recs after, I think it's July, 2017, to the extent that utilities receive the RECs and the net metering customer then receives higher compensation for transferring the RECs, <clears throat> to the extent the utilities receive the RECs, they have to retire them to comply with um, tier two. They cannot resell the RECs associated with net metering. But as I mentioned earlier, there's a fair amount of other non-net metered solar that's been built out in Vermont. Um, so that's most of the rest of tier two the relatively small amount of hydro. And the reason for that is we have a decent amount of small under five megawatt hydro units. Very, very few have been built since 2015 though. And that accounts for why when you think of tier two, it's 98% solar. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> so tier three is, um, a requirement that the electric utilities reduce fossil fuel consumption for their customers. The expectation has always been that most utilities are going to do this through electrification. Um, that helps increase retail sales, spread the fixed costs of the electric system out over more kilowatt hours, and therefore reduce overall cost for um, ratepayers. So this was 2019, what the utilities actually did to implement tier three. Majority is um, heat pumps. Custom is the line extensions that I mentioned, uh, sugaring operations, sawmills, things. Or actually, no, I, I apologize. Custom would be um, specific manufacturing uh, facilities. Line extensions is separate. <clears throat> uh, EVs, 
and partial, or sorry, plug-in hybrid, um, only about 9%. Every utility offers an incentive for EVs and for plug-ins, uh, plug-in hybrids. Uh, it's not a lot of uptake at the moment. Uh, slide 34. Excuse yep. me. Are there, is there a wide variety of, um, of levels of um, subsidy amongst that group, within that group? <clears throat> yes, there is. Um, is it based on economics or culture? Based on, you mean the culture of the organization? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. What, what, to, in, what, in your opinion, has driven the um, wide disparity of of subsidies within that group? Um, I honestly don't know. TJ Poor is the best person to answer that. And I can ask him to, TJ Poor is responsible for tier three compliance overall. And so I'll ask him to respond to that. Thank you. Yep. So slide 34, cost of res compliance. Um, tiers one and two are relatively simple. What's the overall cost to actually retire renewable energy credit to RECs associated with the required portions? Uh, tier one, even though it's a pretty large number of RECs, the RECs are relatively low cost. So 1.2 million for tier one. Tier two, uh, higher value RECs, and we can do a separate presentation just on RECs um, at some other point. But tier two, it's a much smaller number of overall RECs, but there's a premium on them because in part, they're new compared to existing. Um, and also because of, again, the limited eligibility located in Vermont under five megawatts um, built after July 2015. And then there's also the incentives paid for tier three, which were 6 million. So the rate pressure overall, this is not a rate impact. This is essentially looking at the overall cost of the electric system. So um, operating revenues for all the utilities collectively. And then that 11.9 million is roughly 1.4% of that overall um, cost. So we also have an estimate for CO2 reduction, um, about 559,000 tons reduced. And I'll skip over the emissions profile for time. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> We also talked about the standard offer program. This was, I think most folks are familiar with this, put in place 2009, significantly expanded 2012, uh, requires Vermont utilities to purchase the output of small scale renewable resources. In 2009, it was 2.2 megawatts. So essentially the standard offer eligible project has to be under 2.2 megawatts. And the PUC needs to issue standard offers for up to 120 or of at least 127.5 megawatts. The reason I said it's a requirement for most utilities, um, utilities that were 100% renewable as of, I believe it was 2017, might've been 2015. Uh, so that's Burlington Electric, Washington Electric and Swanton Electric um, are all exempt from the standard offer requirements. <clears throat> Associated with standard offer, but not really it's not something I'm going to be touching on in the next couple of slides. Um, baseload renewable portfolio, power portfolio requirement, essentially Rygate, a requirement that the utilities um, essentially pay for or enter into a long-term contract with Rygate to keep Rygate open. That contract ends in 2022 was a 10-year contract. The only utility exempt under this portion of standard offer is Burlington Electric because of their majority ownership of McNeil, another um, biomass plant. Next slide, please. Uh, um, yep. Chairman McDonald. We, we know that um, Rygate does not um, make heat efficiently with chips. 
and and does Burlington share in the same? Uh, does it, does the Burlington Electric plant also um, equally inefficient as Rygate? Are they in the same ballpark? Um, McNeil does not have does not use the waste heat. Um, Rygate might be slightly newer than McNeil, so there might be an overall um, operating efficiency. Their level of, of inefficiency in Rygate has been, they're less inefficient than they were a few years ago, but yeah, but, but I was asking about Burlington. Rygate yep. doesn't use their, their surplus heat. They're, they have a, they're looking into it, but I was asking about Burlington. Yep, and Burlington, uh, the McNeil plant does not currently have an off taker for the waste heat. Um, Burlington Electric Department is looking at that and looking at putting in a um, heating district that would, I think would primarily encompass uh, the hospital and the college. Nearby things. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so the earlier slide was the um, Oh, my apologies. I actually screwed up the slides a little bit, the order of the slides. So the next slide here, 35, um, is actually referring to the overall res program, not standard offer. Can you go to the next slide, please, Philip? Thank you. Um, an earlier slide showed the 2019 cost of compliance. This shows we're also required to estimate over a 10 year period what the cost of renewable energy standard is going to be. Um, given volatility of renewable energy credits, uh, we simply provided uh, quite a ballpark. Anywhere between um, 171 million and 8 million. And the reason for that vast discrepancy is because it's going to depend on what the rec prices are going to be. Are they going to be $60? Or are they going to be $10? Net metering. Net metering is... Um, the highest cost for tier two. So that's a significant driver of the overall cost as well. As we electrify with the tier three measures, are we buying, are, are we buying um, electricity during peak hours or not? This peak contribution of new load doesn't even address the need, the potential need to increase infrastructure and the associated cost with building out infrastructure to meet peak loads. This simply has to do with um, during peak hours, electric prices are higher than off peak hours. And then the reason that we include fossil fuel price as well is that to the extent that you have low fossil fuel prices, less people are going to switch. And so, uh, you know, we talked about the heat pump example. If fossil fuel prices are high, it becomes much easier to convince a customer based on economics to switch to a heat pump. And the assumption there is that the, in, if you have low fossil fuel prices, you need higher incentive levels to get people to move to heat pumps, electric vehicles. If you have low, um, if you have high fossil fuel prices, you need lower incentives. So that's essentially high level why there's such a vast discrepancy in this. Um, Chair, uh, Senator McDonald, just um, whether it's uh, renewable energy um, that is subsidized or whether it's uh, heating fuels that are subsidized, um, do when we're comparing prices, um, we often hear that that we're subsidizing renewable energy and etc. Um, how does the subsidy of renewable energy? compared to the subsidy of oil? Um, good question, and I do not have an answer for that. And uh, you are correct. There's, there's lots of uh, more hidden subsidies. And I say hidden uh, just because they're built into the supply chain, you know, could be lower than market leasing costs, you know, for exploration of oil, all sorts of other things that are not accounted for. For in in which case, oil or renewables? Oil. Um, I'm sorry, oil. Yep. 
And where does nuclear fit in this? Biggest subsidy of all. In terms of subsidy? Is that the question? Well, um, um, it, the low, the incremental cost um, for the long term, yeah. Where, where would it fit? Um, so in terms of subsidy, again, that's not something that uh, we addressed in this report. In terms of how nuclear fits in with overall compliance costs, nuclear is not considered renewable. However, when looking at the an electrification measure and counting fossil fuel reductions associated with an EV or a heat pump, um, it's a utilities power supply portfolio, non-fossil power supply portfolio. So that's both their renewable and also nuclear because nuclear is considered to be zero carbon from an emissions perspective. So it has an indirect impact on um, lowering cost for tier three measures because a utility gains greater credits for tier three if they have nuclear because it reduces the fossil fuel sort of offsets, if that makes sense. It does. Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, and I, um, to answer your earlier question, Chris, um, Seabrook is licensed through 2050. Oh, wow. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank Think you. That we're not going to have <laughs> helpful to know that the landscape's not about to change like 2027 off no. where we go. No. It, 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 it's part of what makes nuclear so difficult. Challenging, yes. Yeah. Um, slide 37, please, Philip. And sorry, uh, sorry for that brief um, interlude back to uh, res costs. So standard offer, this shows the different categories of standard offer um, resources. Uh, you've got biomass, farm methane, food waste, which is another form of anaerobic digester, but different financing uh, structure hydro, landfill, and then we also distinguish large wind over 100 kW and, or it might be 150 kW and under, and then solar PV. You can see that majority of the standard offer projects um, that are under contract are solar PV. So we have about 113 megawatts contracted total. Um, only about 70 of those megawatts have actually been built with a large number still in development. Uh, slide 38, please. <clears throat> so this just shows each year for the last five years, um, how much production we're actually getting. So there's an incremental amount of new megawatt hour generation in that second column. Also the overall program cost and then average price per megawatt hour. So you can see that the costs of standard offer have been coming down. That's in part in 2009, some of the solar projects uh, received 30 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, the most recent costs I think were closer to nine cents a kilowatt hour. You still have the 30 cent a kilowatt hour projects in there and you know, for the next 15 years or so. <clears throat> but overall standard offer costs are coming down. Any questions on res or standard offer before I move to net metering? Yeah, just a quick uh, standard offer question. The contracts, do they vary by source type, contract length? Yep, um, solar PV has 25 year contract length. Uh, landfill gas is a 15 year contract length. Um, it's shorter just because landfill gas tapers off over time. And then the rest, I believe, are all 20, uh, 20 years. Okay, thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Excuse me. So moving on, net metering report. Um, this is something that's required that we submit to the PUC at uh, the same time and also include in the annual energy report. So give a high level summary of <clears throat> what we concluded. Um, Net metering has resulted significant expansion of distributed generation. 
if you look at gen all generation sources in New England, net metering alone is net metered solar is the largest resource in terms of nameplate, not in terms of energy produced, but in terms of nameplate capacity. Um, it's even greater than Hydro Quebec. So also supports a fair number of jobs in Vermont as well. <clears throat> um, one of the things that we concluded, we looked at the history of net metering and how it's changed since 1999 or 98 when it was first put into place. Uh, initial size was 15 kilowatt cap. You know, we've since grown to 500 kilowatt cap. And it was primarily set up to allow customers to offset their usage, their onsite usage. At this point, 77% of net meter generation goes directly to the grid and only 23% is actually used on site by the, by the host customer. <clears throat> the other significant difference uh, between now and uh, 20 years ago is solar has become a mature technology. Uh, you can see this in standard offer prices. We're now seeing uh, less than 10 cents for distributed solar. We're also seeing um, that net metering is producing a substantial cost shift for those customers that don't participate in net, net metering. The rates have gone down in the last couple of years. Uh, they're still at 17 cents a kilowatt hour. <clears throat> and again, that compares to under 10 cents for alternative solar projects, distributed solar. I'll show some graphs later on. Um, we did a REMI economic analysis. REMI is a model that's used pretty widely by um, economists. My apologies. Um, <clears throat> and it shows that with net metering, you have a, a pretty big uh, bump in construction. So you get jobs associated with the construction, but there's a long-term drag on the Vermont economy because you're paying these higher than necessary costs. And an increasing concern is as we move to greater EVs, as we move to more heat pumps, that cost shift is going to increase because now it's net metering is net metered, non-net metered customers are paying for the electric costs, heating costs and transportation costs of net metered customers. So the overall cost shift is going to increase as net metered customers start adding EVs and heat pumps. You repeat that last sentence, please. <clears throat> the overall cost shift of net metering is going to increase as customers who net meter start adding electric vehicles and heat pumps. And so, can you, maybe at another time, Mr. Chair, we'll go into the various moving parts that accounts for the this question. Thank you. Yep. So overall, uh, what the department recommended two years ago um, in a PUC rulemaking on the net metering rule is that the compensation structure ought to change. Department fully supports customers being able to offset their own usage and reduce their electric bills. However, the department is concerned of having net metering customers getting paid more than the value of the generation that they're exporting to the grid. And so a proper compensation structure, um, essentially if you're reducing on-site usage, your own usage, you're getting compensated, so to speak, at your reduced kilowatt hour. Whatever your kilowatt hour rate, you're negating that through your on-site generation. Anything you're exporting to the grid has the same benefit of um, one of these standard offer projects is getting paid less than 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So the department does not see a reason why we should be paying 17 cents a kilowatt hour to what's exported to the grid when other equivalent resources are getting paid under 10 cents. That's something that we intend on continuing to pursue at the PUC through rulemakings, uh, compensation, biannual rate adjustments. Um, next slide, please. This is just a little bit of background. You can see the amount of net metering that's grown 
since um, 2010 to 2020. <clears throat> so we're now at, I think we're a little bit over 260 uh, megawatts of net metered. Again, almost all of that is solar. Uh, next slide, please. Put this chart in here because this is, um, net metering is not spread out equally among all the electric utilities. In particular, you can see Washington Electric Co-op um, has a higher share of the net metering capacity compared to their, their percentage of uh, retail sales. And sorry, I should back up. The very last column percent of retail sales is not associated with net metering. It's their percentage of overall um, electric sales. So Green Mountain Power, obviously the largest, uh, there's more net metering. They have a higher portion of net metering than their portion of load. Same for Washington Electric Co-op. Uh, you have other utilities, Burlington Electric, um, less net metering compared to their percentage of load. <clears throat> so the, the costs of net metering are not spread out among all utility rate pairs equally. And next slide, please. Well, cost of electricity is not spread out amongst all utilities equally either. Isn't that correct? That's absolutely correct. Yep. And in part, that helps explain um, Vermont Public Power Supply Authority is aggregated for this slide. But uh, Philip mentioned earlier Ludlow. Ludlow is got about 10 cents a kilowatt hour for the residential rate, somewhere around there. So there's less incentive for a customer in Ludlow service, service territory to um, do net metering than there is in Washington Electric where it's over 20 cents a kilowatt hour. So partly the different residential costs help contribute to the percentage of um, net metering or the amount of net metering in a service territory. So slide 43, <clears throat> we just put together a different, um, it's a comparison of the relative, of the costs of different renewable resources. So you can see the highest is, um, actually the highest would have been standard offer um, solar from 2009, but in terms of relatively recent resources, standard offer small wind is getting paid a little over 25 cents kilowatt hour. And then you can see net metering, even with the declining costs is the next several categories before you get to farm methane. Rygate is then again lower. And then ESO standard offer solar um, for both this year's bids and last, year bid, last year's bids. And then McNeil um, on the far right as well for a cost. When you're working your way down that chart, which is the first one you get to that's base power? First one that you get to is base power. Um, farm methane is, has a capacity factor of, I believe, somewhere in the 70s, 70%, uh, 70, 70 something percent. Rygate operates closer at 90%, I believe, um, and McNeil at a lower percentage. So it really this uh, the you you um, so when you get to here there's a, there's a degree of apples and oranges here is there not in that from methane to the right um, you have the capacity of producing electricity twenty four hours a day and when you get to the left it's time sensitive, is that correct? That's correct. And you also have, um, Rygate is a smaller dollar amount per KWH. However, it's also producing more KWH over a year than a net metering facility. Because it operates 24 hours a day. Yep, exactly. Yeah, so, um, and our, our problem in electricity 
in electricity in general is that the need is not 24 hours a day. So that's where the apples and oranges come in. So thank you. Thank you. Yep. Um, I would disagree a little bit. Uh, you need some electricity 24 hours a day. Um, and it has been interesting over the last even just five years seeing what the curves at ISO New England and within Vermont, the load curves, how much electricity we use, how that varies. Um, on a spring day, uh, fall day, um, solar has been really helpful in pushing down the, the usage in the middle of the day. Um, and what we're starting to see is prices are higher now, wholesale prices are higher in the winter time, especially after dark. And that's where sort of there might be more value to, or there is more value to reg eight production in the winter time than a kilowatt hour of, uh, let's say solar or any other facility um, during a beautiful spring day when loads are relatively light as well. That's definitely an issue that there's lots of layers in that and we can dive into that pretty deep at some point if the committee would like. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So last slide I'll show. <clears throat> um, so we worked, department worked with um, Agency of Commerce and Community Development on um, this economic modeling of net metering. And it's an interesting issue because the model works um, we had to run a couple of years and I'm not the, the modeling person at all for the department. So I can only get to a certain level on this. Um, but essentially the jobs and are so primarily associated with the construction, the development, you know, the siting, some of the other aspects. Once that's done, once the project's in the ground, um, then, sorry, all those jobs help push up the number of jobs, they push up GDP and then once those jobs are done, because of the above market, the above alternative cost, um, it becomes a drag on overall Vermont GDP, um, disposable income for Vermonters as well. So far, this has been, this effect has been largely masked because if you keep the net metering program going and never have the drop off, you're never going to see, or it, it's, that decline in disposable personal income, the dis decline in Vermont GDP is masked by the continued growth of new construction as well. Um, and that's something that if people wanna do a deep dive on this, uh, there's some really good folks who do economic modeling at Agency of Commerce and Community Development. I'd suggest bringing those folks in. I've also included a number, yep. And um, uh, I cut in, um, um, the chairman has um, lost his internet and um, it is now 1150 and I hate to cut you off, but um, um, the new president's being sworn in. Okay, Thank absolutely. you, Senator West. So no. I, I, I um, will come, um, we'll come back to you and get you, and I'm gonna cut things off so people can go watch. Great, thank you very much. It's much more important. So, all right, take care, bye. Thank you. 